This morning's meeting of the Infrastructure Committee. Um, we have a quorum, um, just to indicate that we have two members who will be um, with us via the Starleaf. So we have Dolores Kelly and Martina Anderson. And I understand that um, Andrew Muir will be, be late. So we move then to um, an overview of today's business. What we plan to do is consider um, subordinate legislation and also we'll be receiving departmental briefings in respect of permitted development rights and um, from the DVA in relation to MOTs, lifts and driving tests. With other apologies, um, moving then to Chair's business. Um, just seek your agreement for the weekly Brexit agenda, which has been issued by the committee. Um, this will be emailed to members when available, rather than issued in the committee packs, because sometimes this may actually there may be issues that um, members would like to be involved in, which um, precede um, our committee meeting. Um, if you look at page nine of um, table papers, there's a letter from the clerk in the CAMS office to the chairpersons of the three committees that meet on Wednesday mornings. There is an issue of accommodating meetings of standing committees on Wednesdays and also in respect of PI communications who are working in bubbles. So we've now been informed that once every three weeks we will then meet in room 29 and our meeting must finish at 12 on that occasion. Um, Alternatives are to meet in the Assembly Chamber or in Room 21, which has teleconferencing, but Starleaf can't be issued in either of those rooms for, for a number of reasons. So if members are, are content to note that, and obviously that our first week of doing, so will be next week. Mm -hmm. um, and we may we will need to start the meeting at 9.30, um, given um, what's on the agenda, because we haven't been able to plan in advance of that. So the chair, I, I take it, Chair, this is issues brought up at the Chairperson Liaison Group, yeah? Yeah. And I mean, that, is that that's the opinion of all other committees trying to work yeah. together? Just, yeah. Well, it's really, um, it's it's an accommodation now that has to be made alongside ourselves with economy mm -hmm. and education as well. Okay. Um, no, I know it's happening, I so think, on Thursday as well with some of the committees. The same thing, you know. But I think there's also an issue in relation to the length of time that's required between um, the meetings as well. I think it's maybe been extended to 40, 40 minutes, yeah. which then just... Creates, uh, just gives a little bit more time then for them to um, to make the necessary arrangements to make the room ready for oh. the next meeting. I also advise that departments have been asked to submit revised October monitoring returns to DOF Public Spending Directorate as the Minister for Finance has indicated that he may be in a position to make a statement on October monitoring. Um, the, the clerk has requested this information but as yet we've not received any revised figures from the Minister. Um, do members agree that we write to the Minister mm -hmm. to ascertain if she has made any changes to her monitoring, October monitoring submission and do request a copy of that? Great. Okay, thank you. Moving then to draft minutes, you'll find those at page six of your packs and they're the minutes of last of the meeting of the 21st of October. So if members are content to agree those. Great. Okay. <coughs> Moving then to matters arising. And that's at page 13. And again, that's for the meeting of the 21st of October. Do members have any issues arising from that meeting? No, okay. Um, page 17, you'll find outstanding committee requests for information, and they're still generally within the time frame we've got just one night's outstanding response really which is from the PSNI with regards to additional information um, yeah. which we can which we can follow um, oh, email issued on the 2nd of November do we know what that what that refers to just in regards to was that just as a, a, a reminder to the PSNI yeah. yeah okay thank you Moving then to correspondence, just draw your attention to the memo at page 23 and tabled at page 3 on page 26, we have departmental response to committee um, correspondence regarding issues which were raised at our meeting on the 7th of October. Are members any comments on that? Not at the stage, okay. Um, page 91, we have the departmental Can response. Just to the chair, sorry. Is that the one in relation to the, the vehicles? Procurement? No, all right. That's a different page, is it? Um, 26. 
that's the one we have in relation to advanced driving instructors, All right, SNAP no, sorry, legislation. I something I just want to bring up yeah, sorry. Um, it was just the timeline in relation to um, <coughs> the submission to the First and Deputy First Minister around the college pack, or the, pack, or the package of support. No, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, page 91, um, that's that, that piece of correspondence. Then moving then to um, tabled at page 7 with the interim report from the examiner of, of statutory rules, Angela Kelly, and she's highlighted one SR, which is SR 2020 to 108, which is the Planning Development Management Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2020. Um, being advised that the committee agreed this statutory rule. Subject to the, the examiner's report, the examiner has now advised that she will not draw special attention of, this, of the assembly to this SR in the report, other than it breaks the 20 day, 21 day rule. Um, members generally then content with the actions that have been suggested in the correspondence memo as to how we deal with the remainder of correspondence. Okay, moving then to item six which is subordinate legislation, SL1s, which aren't subject to assembly proceedings. We have SL1, the roads speed limit number two, order Northern Ireland 2020. SL1, the roads speed limit order number three, order Northern Ireland 2020. And SL1, the roads speed limit number four, order Northern Ireland 2020. There are three proposals for statutory rules, the purpose of which is to set new speed limits and restrictions, and that's on a range of roads sort of across Northern Ireland. In the SL1s, the department has set out the new speed limits in each of the areas and the rationale for those changes. Uh, the SL1s are at pages 144, 147 and 150. These um, Proposals are not subject to <coughs> assembly proceedings. Are you all content with the proposals for the statutory rule? Have you any issues to raise? No, no. All content? Okay, thank you. Um, SL1, the parking and waiting restrictions, Drumore Order, Northern Ireland 2020, and you'll find that at page 152. The rule will authorise a length of Market Square, Drumore, to be used as a parking place and prescribe the conditions under which it may be used. The parking place in Market, Market Square is being introduced as part of an environmental improvement scheme. These proposals, again, are not subject to assembly proceedings. Are members content with the proposals of the statutory rule? Thank you. SL1, the Seago Industrial Street Craigavon Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2020, and you'll find that at page 155. This rule is subject to negative resolution procedure in the assembly. The rule will abandon an area of road consisting of five areas of carriageway, footpath and verge at Seago Industrial Estate in Craigavon. The abandonment has been requested by the adjacent factory owners so that they can erect a new gated entrance and restrict the public access over the lands. The applicant has agreed to provide alternative facilities. Following a period of consultation, there have been no objections to the proposal. Are members content with the proposals for the statutory rule? Okay, item 8, SL1, the Killy Valley Road, um, Garva, uh, that's the abandonment order in Northern Ireland 2020, and you'll find that at page 159. This rule is subject to negative resolution procedure in the Assembly. The rule will abandon an area of former road at Killy Valley Road. The abandonment has been requested by the adjacent engineering works so that the area may be incorporated into their entrance. The applicant has agreed to provide alternative facilities by extending the footway on Killy Valley Road. Following a period of consultation, there have been no objections to the proposal. Have members any issues or are you content? Content. Yep. Item 9, and you'll find that at page 164, and this is the SL1 for the Port Services Amendment EU exit regulations Northern Ireland 2020. The rule is subject to negative resolution procedure in the Assembly. The statutory rule will address the deficiencies in regulation EU 2017-352, the EU port services regulation arising from the United Kingdom's exit from the European Union. The amendments in this rule are intended to ensure that the EU port services regulation will continue to function effectively after the end of the implementation period for the withdrawal of the UK from the EU. 
In the absence of these amendments, some of the legislation which was drafted in the context of the UK's membership of the EU would either lack clarity or fail to operate effectively after the implementation period um, is being completed. Are members content with the proposals for the statutory rule? Content. Okay. Moving then to um, agenda items 16 and 17. So we're just going to take it slightly out of sequence. Um, and you'll find um, this at your, in your table papers. Uh, so table papers, pages 20. Um, with the taxi driver regulations proposed taxi driver support scheme. These rules are subject to negative resolution in the Assembly. The Department proposes to use the powers conferred by the First Minister and Deputy First Minister to make two sets of regulations to provide separate financial schemes for taxi drivers and bus and coach operators. The differing circumstances of each sector means that bespoke schemes are required. For each scheme, the regulations will specify the purpose and nature of the financial mm -hmm. assistance, the eligibility criteria and the application process. So we do have officials in attendance. Um, are members content that we maybe bring them in just for some clarification? Great. So we have Dr um, Chris Hughes, who is the Director of Safe and Accessible <coughs> Travel, Beverly Cowan, the Head of Driving Policy, and Donald Starrett from Safe and Accessible Travel, and he deals with the legislation. Um, the proposals um, for the scheme will obviously specifically um, look at financial assistance. Okay, good morning to, to all of you. You're very welcome to the committee this morning. And obviously just wanted to um, have a, a brief discussion in relation to, um, to the SL1 before us um, with regards to um, the support scheme which is being offered. Um, are you in a position maybe just to give us some detail as to how you came to the amounts which are now being proposed for um, the support to both taxi drivers and to coach operators? Sure, I'll um, take the, the taxi one. <coughs> um, just to say, we had asked for evidence um, uh, following initial engagement with, with both sectors. Um, and the minister had spoken to both sectors as well um, to help us, um, I suppose, determine the exceptional cir circumstances existed for the sectors. Um, we asked them to provide evidence to help us determine that. And on that basis, then <coughs> uh, they provided the information about their overhead costs. Um, for example, these would be tax, uh, taxi insurance. Um, obviously, they had a cost for PSV license, um, PPE costs. And so they provided that information. Um, we did an independent assessment of that information, independent analysis, which corroborated with the, the figures that the industry had provided. Um, and based on that, um, the amount is a contribution uh, to their overhead costs that they have incurred, uh, as I say, including tax, PPE. Uh, and insurance costs. There isn't an element for PSV because obviously with her <coughs> uh, decision to make regulatory easements, the Minister um, extended those licences so that wasn't wasn't included. Okay. And for the bus and coach, um, it was again we the Minister had discussions with the sector and it was based on the reserves that they're required to have for uh, for their vehicles. So that's 8,000 for the first vehicle and 4,450. So that's a requirement that they have to prove that they're of good financial standing. So that's the basis on which that was done. That was done in discussion with the sector. Okay, so this was really done in relation particularly with the taxis in order to look at overhead as opposed to lost income? Yes. I think you know there were other schemes uh, available uh, to in varying degrees to the industry for uh, loss of income, the SEISS scheme, for example. Um, but this was a recognition that any of the schemes out there, if they were eligible, uh, applied or didn't apply, that this was a recognition that those schemes did not cover their um, unique overhead costs. Um, and this is how we, as was determined, their circumstances were exceptional. Unlike other um, businesses, they had a disproportionately high um, overheads um, for their business, and it's a recognition of that and a contribution to that. Okay, there's obviously a criticism that probably that this isn't this obviously isn't enough. 
Sorry, Michelle, there sorry. would be a criticism that this would not be enough. Yes, I think it's, it's like all, all the other schemes that are out there. It, the intention wasn't to 100% uh, cover the costs. Um, like the other schemes, this is about, um, I suppose, an, an element of managing public money here and ensuring value for money. Um, obviously, some people did avail of the other schemes. Um, there have been periods where... Um, the sector has been able to work in and out of the restrictions. So this is, as I say, rather than 100% um, uh, reimbursement of overhead costs, a contribution um, to those costs uh, in line with, with other um, support they may have received or work that they, they had ongoing during the period in question. Okay, we've received correspondence in relation to um, taxi operators and a distinction perhaps being made between the operators within the taxi industry and the bus operators. Could you maybe give some um, clarification around that? Sure. Um, it, tax, taxi oper operators, again, <clears throat> this is all um, the decisions made um, on the £1,500, etc., um, identified um, based on the evidence that the industry provided. So um, we received um, evidence and information from taxi operators as well. From that information, we were able to determine that they could and did avail of some of the other um, support schemes that were available during that time. Uh, the um, business, the small support business scheme, the, the 10K one, um, the tourism, hospitality, um, retail one, the 25K. Um, they also um, were able to avail of uh, VAT deferral for quarter one in, of this year and rates deferrals on most of the properties. In, their, in, in the information they, they provided, and they have said this publicly as well, that uh, in terms of um, their view was the best way that we could help uh, with the situation was to provide support for taxi drivers. Um, that would help taxi drivers to uh, stay in business until trade picked up. Um, so if you like, direct, or sorry, indirect intervention um, was what they, they suggested. Um, but in terms of their exclusion, those were the primary reasons that they could and did avail of the other, other schemes available. Okay, and just finally for me, um, is there an update with regards to the support package for hauliers? <clears throat> so um, the executive paper that was agreed didn't have a support package for hauliers on it, so the, um, the minister has, has uh, looked at the evidence and at this stage has not assessed that there was um, ev the evidence for... Um, for, the inter for requesting an inter identifying an intervention, but she has undertaken to keep that under review. So it's just being kept under review as to post actually being something being currently worked up? Yes, but there has been actually quite a bit of evidence has been examined to determine a decision that at this point exceptional circumstances did not apply. Okay, and um, are you aware, do you know if we can be furnished with that information as to how that, that that um, decision was made? Yeah, um, I mean, it looked like, yeah, absolutely. Um, but I can tell you that it looked at, um, so uh, Minister Murphy um, was asked for a view and assessed that there was no exceptional circumstances that prevented them applying to existing schemes. So then we looked at additional evidence. So there was a working group done by uh, Joint DERA and DFI earlier in the summer, whenever there were concerns around the supply chain issues about that. There was a critical supply analysis group that set up to look specifically at this, and it was with a concern for the food supply, keeping that as normal, and that the, food, the food supply continued to go and is currently at normal. There was also a DFT did an examination across the UK, and they looked at evidence to see was there that they could present to the evidence to make an intervention particularly in this sector, and they found that there was not sufficient evidence, or they, they, as they said, that the bar for the DA, for Treasury was going to be high, but that bar was not met, so there was not the evidence looking across the UK. Um, also, the businesses did have access to the various schemes, both the business loan scheme and the job support scheme. Um, Logistics UK do a business tracker, so um, there is a positive outlook for, the, as of now, there is a positive outlook for, um, for the sector. Um, there's been um, a, a pickup across. Vacancies are currently running above average for the sector, um, and there are more businesses with cash reserves currently for six months ahead than there were beforehand. So the, the signs across the sector are actually that while individual operators and particular sectors may have had difficulties, the sector as a whole, the evidence that has been looked at, has provided no evidence that would say there are exceptional circumstances applying at this point in time. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms Anderson? <coughs> 
thank you. Uh, thank you for that information. And Chair, just picking up what you asked around taxi operators, we know in the table papers today, there are a number of the taxi operators have sent correspondence to us. And I've listened to interviews uh, from the minister who said that other help was available for taxi operators. So could the officials outline what that help is? And can I also concur with what you said with regards to the funding that is available for taxi drivers? Uh, because probably like many of the other MLAs, I have been receiving correspondence from the taxi drivers who are very disappointed with what they had received, especially after the consultation that had taken place with the Minister. Yep. Um, just the point, um, Martina, just about, about the operators, uh, as I explained, the reason they were excluded was because there was evidence, the evidence they provided indicated that they could and, and did avail of the available schemes. Um, and going forward, um, the Minister has... Sorry, had, Beverly, could you outline to me what those schemes were? Because um, they're telling me contrary to that, just so yes. that I know what are the schemes that they have failed of. Yep. The Small Business Support Scheme, which was 10, 000, a £10,000 grant. The Retail Hospitality, Tourism and Leisure Grant, which was £25,000. Uh, they also availed of the Furlough Scheme, um, and they also availed of uh, rates deferral on some or most of their properties um, and deferral of VAT in some cases as well. Um, just in going forward, obviously at, at this point we are focusing on, on trying to um, deliver this scheme uh, as quickly as possible, obviously recognising um, the hardship that has been uh, felt by, by the sector. Um, in terms of taxi drivers and, and deliver that scheme as quickly as we possibly can, at the same time ensuring that all the checks and balances are in place to do so. In, in terms of what's available now or what might be available, um, uh, the Minister has engaged um, and corresponded with uh, the Economy Minister on the schemes that are uh, being developed or have been developed. Um, certainly the CRBSS scheme, which is a scheme I think uh, the operators are referring to uh, in their conversations or engagement with the department and the minister. The minister did mention the scheme uh, would be available um, and it's, it's more relevant I suppose in terms of part B of that scheme which is about to launch this week um, and we are waiting for detailed guidance on um, but that's the, the scheme that uh, provides uh, support for those in the supply chain and the minister has made the case and argued consistently that uh, the taxi sector, including operators, uh, should be included uh, in the development and finalisation of that scheme. In terms of the other schemes, uh, and in relation to taxi, dri taxi drivers specifically, they will again be able to avail of the SEISS scheme, which obviously extends from the 1st of November. And then the Economy Department also has a scheme for uh, newly employed uh, 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 self-employed, uh, newly self-employed uh, workers, which will cover taxi drivers, for example, who have been employed in the last year but would have been excluded from the previous SEISS scheme. Um, can, can I continue, Chair? Can I just ask you that, um, or tell you that, <coughs> excuse me, a number of the um, taxi drivers are telling me that they have contacted, for instance, it's in FSNI, that the Department for Economy scheme that you refer to in of SNI has told them on both occasions that they do not qualify and will not qualify. And they have heard the Minister say on three occasions that the taxi drivers would be able to qualify for that Cat B scheme um, of the recent Department for Economy. Uh, and yet they're hearing or they're being informed by Infest NI and that that is not the case. So I think that needs to be pursued further. Um, and I, you, you obviously know that the self-employed, the newly self-employed scheme um, has not yet been established. So the, uh, the taxi drivers and the operators do not uh, know if they will fit in to the, uh, to the criteria whenever that is the, you know, finalized. So I think the current funding arrangements chair it doesn't address the hardship uh, that they have felt this year 
and I think further support is required. And we also need chair to be looking at a sector such as wedding cards operators, because they have been in touch with many of the MLAs flagging up that they have been left out of these schemes. Um, Martina, I'll just pick up, um, I suppose, just in, in relation to looking at this, this scheme, which obviously re uh, received last Thursday executive uh, support uh, in relation to uh, the, int the policy intention and uh, its rollout. Obviously, this is aimed at, rather than looking at individual sectors within, um, I suppose, the, the taxi sector or those um, defined as that under the Taxis Act in Class A, B, C, D, uh, which we know um, other operators are um, included in, and also by way of the um, FMD, FM determination. Um, you know, rather than looking at those individual sectors, what th this scheme will do, if you know, it's aimed at self-employed taxi drivers um, who meet and will meet the eligibility criteria that is currently being drafted, and that's regardless of whether they're in the the wedding car sector or whether they're a traditional, as you, if you like, tax, taxi driver. Um, the fact that they hold a, a taxi driver licence will um, is the first point of eligibility for, for the scheme. And then, Beverly, I think the, the point should be made that while you said the evidence uh, shows that they were able to access in the first wave of this awful pandemic, the 10,000, as did many others in the hospitality sector. And yet, during this now second wave, the executive and the ministers uh, relating to those different sectors seeing the need for further support. And yet, I'm hearing sort of that being flagged up um, as evidence, well, they received it, the 10,000 uh, back in March and April, and therefore don't qualify now, or that wasn't the approach uh, was taken by other ministers, and I think rightly so, during this wave when, for instance, the industry, whether it was the hospitality industry, was hit again. So I just think it's it's not fair that those that may have been able to avail of that 10,000 that that's held up as well. They got that back then, and, and that should assist them with the ongoing hardship that they are experiencing now. I just want to make that point here. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr Buchanan. Thank you. Thank you, Beverly and uh, Chris. I see Donald over there as well. Just, just a point. Can you confirm to me how long your department or your sales have been working on this scheme? So, in other words, when did you initially start to do homework <coughs> for taxis, haulage, and coaching operators? Um, well, obviously, obviously um, the minister, um, as I mentioned earlier, she met uh, with both sectors. Um, she's met with them twice on the thirtieth of September. Um, and the 22nd or 27th rather of October. Um, so at the meeting of the 30th of September, um, up until that point, uh, there had been exchanges, as you will be aware, uh, with the Minister and FM and DFM about her um, virus for taking forward a scheme um, and an acknowledgement that she didn't have the virus to take forward. Um, any scheme for both sectors. Um, so that running parallel uh, to that, um, the FM and DFM uh, wrote to the minister asking her to the question uh, in, uh, in terms of exceptional circumstances. Um, and as a consequence of that, then the minister met with the sectors um, to have that conversation, explain the position, um, and that she had been tasked with um, establishing or determining whether exceptional circumstances existed for the three sectors um, at this stage, obviously including uh, haulage. Um, during those conversations, um, she made it clear that in order to um, design a scheme, or you know, if, if that's where this was going, and she was um, designated uh, to provide a scheme for one or other of the sectors um, that she would have to establish whether exceptional circumstances existed. And on that basis, then, she asked them to provide us with evidence um, of their uh, overheads and uh, any hardship uh, that they had incurred as a consequence of the uh, lockdowns and the, the circumstances. So. I suppose really that's the, that's the starting point for that, Kate. Um, Are you saying then, Beverly and Chris, that there was no preparatory work done prior to the 30th of September? 
in the department? I suppose whenever you're asking that question, and um, a lot of what so we're in other words, I'm saying it was coming. You knew it was going to come. Well, so we didn't work behind the scenes. Well, we knew it was potentially coming. So, which so is the, a, the department we said real. that they'd done it in six days. It's factically wrong. So, some within the department said that the scheme was produced in six days, which is incorrect. But we should be working on it for more than six days. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay. okay. Next point I want to go on to is um, buses and coach industries. Obviously, a coach operator, let's say for example, has four four coaches at a value of eight hundred thousand to a million, depending on the type of work he or she does. Another coach operator could have four buses doing a different type of work. So one could be doing a yachts or a cruisers, other could be doing end parties or that type of work. Do you see the scheme fair that the same both operators is going to get £21,350 based? One operator could have a value of coaches of 40000 the other could have up in a million. Um, it's based on, the scheme is based on identifying the Running costs and the loss of income. So that is the basis on which it is, and it's the based on cost, the, Chris, the running cost. Chris, of a, a bus at two hundred fifty thousand is different than the running costs if you take in HP, etc. Than a bus at ten thousand. I mean, uh, there are um, that gets you into areas about where you're looking at the, the commercial decisions that individual operators have taken, which is an area between probably them and their financiers and their banks. So um, that becomes. Uh, <coughs> It, it, it becomes very complex, and it's outside certainly the remit of the, the paper that was agreed by the executive, which is to use the, the reserves. Now, the reason why the reserves were chosen was because that indicates good financial standing. The objective here is to try and ensure that businesses remain go, remain viable, and um, <coughs> excuse me. Also, as part of this, that uh, the minister did encourage the, uh, the, the the finance minister to, to to make the case for businesses to, for the banks to be flexible because these are, are businesses that have assets and will be viable going forward but that gets you into commercial decision based did, on did that exactly gives different options to the department you know based on different operators mm -hmm. did they, they, those operators give different options to the department um yes based on the value of coaches obviously. that was that was certainly one of the suggestions yeah and just final question then uh, so a coach operator, if they received the ten thousand or the twenty five thousand in the past, has that any a negative effect on this support? Um, no, uh, it doesn't. So um, if they have received that, that will not be taken off anything that they would be uh, entitled to under the scheme as, as agreed. Okay. And just final point. So back to my operator example of four buses or coaches. What's the definition of a bus? You know, what's your, uh, you know, disease buses need to be registered before a certain date or except you know, my point? This is, um, I, I actually would need to, I need to confirm the detail of that. I know that each operator has licences. So, you know, is it, is it, so does the licence need to have on a coach you know, prior a certain date? I'd, I'd, I'd need to check the detail exactly of that. Okay. I, I don't have yeah. that to hand. Thank you, Chair. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Boylan. Thank you, Chair, and thanks very much for coming. But I just want to go back across a few points because I mean I'm, I'm getting the same as my colleague did and many other colleagues. I mean about the fifteen hundred. To be honest with you, I mean, can, can you just outline exactly because you, you mentioned all the schemes, the rate space people were entitled to claim the scheme from the start. So you mentioned four. You mentioned these four other schemes. But let's go back to the terms of reference exactly, which in one in one point you're saying. It wasn't a hardship issue, it was a support issue, and then you said it's hardship and support. Now, over the last seven months, if we work out 1,500 quid, it's like it could be 40 something pounds. Now, because I want to go back to trying to establish a hardship. I do welcome some support, the, the committee's been crying out for it, but I'm trying to establish how we come up at this point. But the first question is the terms of reference are exactly um, where, where their starting point was. Was it the case? Of support was the case of hardship. What exactly was the terms of reference in common conclusion that fifteen hundred quid would be acceptable to each? I, t I take it that's over nine. There's nine thousand. That's the whole lot. So that's inclusive of all the operators, all those people who have got monies. Some who are lucky enough to get monies through the other scheme as well. Yeah. Uh, well, no, the nine thousand. The Nine thousand. It's I think it's nine thousand three hundred and twenty-seven or thereabouts. But that, that's the number of ta taxi drivers, yeah, yeah. Cal. Yeah, yeah. Um, just just in terms of 
of the basis for this. I mean, it's sort of the point that I, I've made, um, I suppose, to Keith. Um, I mean, the starting point for this is where obviously there were, there were the discussions around who had responsibility or VARES for providing any sort of scheme. Um, we're familiar uh, with that yes. point. Yes, <laughs> you're well aware <laughs> of that. We definitely cross over that yes. point. We're definitely very familiar with that point. Um, so I suppose, you know, if, if we're looking at the basis, um, it is the, the first point was to identify whether exceptional circumstances existed for this sector. And, you know, that was our starting point for looking at the um, amount of money. Um, coupled with that, obviously, this amount of money was not uh, reimbursement of income. There were other schemes for that. This was not about um, providing someone with 100% reimbursement for income lost. This was about providing um, support in the way of a financial contribution to the overheads that they had incurred um, during a period when trade was restricted, I suppose, because of the lockdown restrictions and because of the fact that people weren't going out. And Tam, so how then, in terms of the self-employed, was it? It'd be interesting to know how many of the industry, those individuals, many of the industry did you go out and consult with to get an average right across the board and find out about the overheads and the impact it would have? Because, you know, I, I understand it and learn from all the schemes because we've all been here and we've seen, and I, I do agree, we won't, everybody wasn't going to get everything, but certainly a reasonable amount of money for, for each individual. You know, most of us would have supported. I, I just think looking at that amount. But, but I mean, how many people did you... Go right across the board and say, you're t "You said to me the number of people you went after, on average, this is what the figure you could come up with." So many people did you did you actually have a conversation around? Well, well, we um, obviously we didn't ask. Now, we, you know, again, in terms of or, the, or even the representatives of the yes, they were representatives, and I suppose that's the way to, to um, I suppose you know illustrate illustrate the point that. Um, uh, we had a, a we were confident that the uh, representatives from the industry that yeah. spoke to us and engaged with us um, were there representing members in their organizations like the Northern Ireland Taxis Association the Northwest uh, taxi proprietors um, there was also legal representation <coughs> um, from Phoenix law for public hire so we had uh, if you imagine, uh, I'm never going to remember all their names, but if you imagined at, at one of our meetings, there, there might have been 10 to 15 individuals at that meeting, but they were representing hundreds and hundreds of other... No, no, I appreciate it. And, and you're saying, even the likes of Phoenix Law, are you, are you saying through all the discussions, the 1,500 was reasonable right across the board in the views that you ascertained? Because when I say that to you, I'm following up on some of the questions, because now taxi people are coming to me especially in my own area, where individuals are saying to me, hold on a minute here, from, from the heard about the scheme first, the amount, after the meeting with the minister, then obviously they heard it out through the news, 1,500. They're now come, if you say to me that you, you had con consulted with the industry and they're saying the majority were content with what, the 1,500, now we're getting a number of people coming to say, hold on a minute here. So somewhere... Probably the, the discussions has fallen down. You know what I mean? So well, I, I would just say that uh, we're um, um, just on the basis that we're unlikely to make people content. Um, no, so no, no, I mean, no, what, no. We, what we have I, to do is look at ensuring that we provide value for money. And the objective of the scheme, as set out in the in the paper, was to put a contribution to tractors that are to uh, to taxi drivers that allow them to continue to well, trade. Well, I don't want to prolong so, the meeting, but yeah. it's an important thing for because most have been fighting this for six months, seven months. Well, I mean, if I, well, I'll, I'll try and clarify the, with the point for you, Carol, with a li little bit more information. With <clears throat> um, uh, the period that we're looking at, obviously, is the period from you know mid March yeah. up until September. Um, Obviously, you know, prior to that period, we wouldn't be looking at providing anyone with financial support for or, or for any need prior to that point. Um, obviously, going forward, as we've talked about, is another matter. But in relation to the period that's passed, um, which is, is is the period that this scheme deals with, um, the representations and the evidence that we received provided us with actual figures for overheads, um, which were um, indicative. Um, of our, you know, the range of taxi drivers well, I appreciate out there. It, and that, that's grand. So, I mean, that's support. But there's extreme hardship over six months. 
So, I mean, if you're just saying about their overheads, I mean, there was all other elements, and, and all I'm saying is every other department looked at different ways. I mean, this was a unique case. It was a pandemic, and all I'm saying is at, at no point you know, that hasn't been considered. We were arguing the toss over the various between each department, and all I'm saying is I'm just going on what the industry is saying to me and some of the industry, because you've engaged parts of that industry has come back and says to me and other members that they're not happy with what they get. I suppose the other point so. I would make in, you know, in looking at, at those costs and in looking at, at those figures which we based uh, the, um, the payment on, uh, obviously you know, the evidence also indicated that the industry taxi, taxi drivers were able to avail um, of the SAISS schemes as well. Um, if I ask you now, because I don't want to hog the meeting chair, but it's important, because you know this might be the only crack we get. At this. How many, can you then clarify how many people actually, you know, got money or entitled to money? How many people are going? You know, we know how many is going to get the fifteen hundred. Can you break all that down? Because that should have been part of the whole process. Because you can't be saying we we'll, we'll work out our scheme, but still not all members of the industry can go after the scheme or that scheme. Because that should have been part of your whole. The whole makeup of the process in the first place. To be honest with you, not saying we will give you fifteen on them. By the way, and go on to play for this scheme. That's. That's. I mean, that actually was a matter for the individual taxi driver to make. So, I mean, because the, uh, that that was a decision that they had to make. What we had to do was look at the at the at the, the evidence for the costs that were incurred, and look at that for the basis of that scheme. We are aware that taxi drivers could. Available. <coughs> well, that gets down to 9,000 individual decisions as to whether they're. No, I, I appreciate that. So it's not something we're aware of it, but it's not something that we could take account of, particularly as, as, as you're well aware, we're asked to be doing something that is evidence based and also relatively swift so that we can get money out to the taxi. Well, well I, I think, Chair, because I'll have to leave it at that, because there's, tr- there's going to be more questions, obviously. But, but going forward, what's the options on the table in terms of, besides other schemes, is the department looking at other? support mechanisms for the tax industry. What, we, what we're trying to do at this point in time is operationalise the paper that was agreed by the executive, which is to put in place a scheme which we're able to launch on the, on the 9th of September. So that is what, that is what the, the SL1 is, is about, operationalising that, that issue. OK, thank you, Chair. We'll come back to that. Sort of, okay. But thank you very much. For... Thank you. Andrew Muir. Thank you, Chair. And, um, apologies for my lateness. Um, and also, just to clarify, that was previously an employee of um, TransLink. Um, just a few things. Uh, Martina Armstrong picked up the issue in relation to wedding cars, and I think it's important that that issue is addressed. My colleague Stuart Dixon is meeting with the minister today, alongside one of uh, the businesses affected by that. And you know, we, we, I think the purpose of this scheme is to try to address people who were excluded. So we want to make sure that it's encompassing and doesn't leave people um, in, in need of support. Um, just in relation to the £1,500, um, express understand the context upon which you have outlined the basis of that, but the feeling that has been expressed to me is it is a rather paltry sum um, to help people through this, because also, albeit we are referring to the restrictions and how that had an impact, but to the pandemic, since it started, has had an impact as well. Over the summer, the trade has been significantly depleted, and those overheads have still had to be paid. So, whether there be any consideration made in the due course in the months ahead, looking for additional assistance uh, for taxi drivers. Uh, and the, the, the newly self-employed has been talked about, and I think that is important that a scheme is brought forward. That was brought forward in Wales and Scotland. It still has not occurred here, and I know that is not within your remit. It is within the Department of the Economy. I just want to put that on record. It is really important that something is done around that, um, because if other parts of the UK are able to do it, then we should. Um, in relation there was discussion around taxis and private uh, bus and coach operators and giving them assistance, and also hauliers. Um, and I've been contacted by quite a number of hauliers over the months uh, looking for assistance. And they had real hopes something like this would come forward and give them assistance because their trade was significantly down during the pandemic uh, at the beginning and it came back a wee bit. But it's not uh, on, on the basis of what it was, and I know of at least one firm that is uh, now having to explore redundancies, also in the context of Brexit and the costs associated with that. Um, I know that there was a letter came through, and it was the view was the evidence wasn't strong enough to suggest that exceptional circumstances exist to justify the bespoke financial scheme. And just to see if it would be possible to get that evidence shared, because those companies will <coughs> make contact, you know, and want to know why they're getting no assistance at all. In the context of the circumstances I've outlined. 
because you want me to yes, roll, 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 roll. So, um, just the, uh, as I was saying earlier, we did look at a, there was a range of evidence examined for that. So, to pick up on your point about uh, redundancies, there, there, um, at the moment the numbers of vacancies are above average <coughs> for people working in the haulage sector. So, there were, or there were a number of um, streams of evidence that were examined before that conclusion was reached. Um, so, uh, at the start of the uh, at the start of the pandemic, um, there was a mixed picture. Um, there was a joint DARE and DFI uh, working group set up to ensure that the supply chain maintained um, its operation. So, there was a central supply good analysis group set up and looked at that. Currently, the food supply chain is normal, um, and DFT also looked UK wide at evidence to see was there uh, was there evidence to go to the treasury with to actually make the case for a scheme for the whole sector and they found that it was not the evidence that would have made the case for a successful a successful application to the treasury for a scheme um, there are there are um, the uh, businesses are able to, are also able to access other schemes the business loan scheme and the job support scheme um, and there's a logistics UK <coughs> tracker scheme which looks at the business across the UK so I'm, I'm apologies to members for our outline no, okay. um, so there is currently a positive outwork uh, businesses has been picked, uh, businesses have been picked up from um, up to 2.8 percent as I said their vacancies are actually running above average and currently more businesses have cash reserves that will keep them going forward for six months plus than they were at the start of the pandemic. So the evidence at the moment is that while low individual hauliers, particularly depending on the sector, the health of the haulage business, the evidence that has been made available to us and that we have seen in offer actually indicates that there is not the case that would support exceptional circumstances applying to the haulage sector. So there is as a range of I appreciate that. Um, I think the issue for me is that the DFT scheme, there was a no from that, and there was a real hope and a real aspiration that some assistance would be coming from, you know, in Northern Ireland from the from the executive, and that hasn't materialised. Now, I don't know whether some of this can be shared with the committee in, in you know, written format or whatever else, so we can share that with the, the haulage industry, because they really are having a very difficult time, particularly in the context of Brexit and the additional costs that are going to arise as a result of that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Beggs. Yeah, thank you for your information so far. Um, one worry they have, have is around the, the, the level of financing. How did you come across the figure of 1,500? Why was it not 3,000 or 1,000? How did you settle on 1,500? Um, well, Roy, as I was mentioned earlier, um, we, we asked the, the industry for evidence and information, um, and they provided that in relation to um, you know, during the engagement with them, they made it clear that w one of the issues they had was with, um, and were struggling with, was their overheads um, that c continued or needed to be paid um, <coughs> despite them potentially not having uh, work. Um, they provided information and evidence on those overheads. So, for example, um, there would have been information on uh, their tax cost, their Taxi uh, insurance cost. Um, obviously, I'd mentioned the PSV license um, uh, money that they had paid uh, or been out of pocket on, on PPE uh, to ensure their vehicles met the the the, the uh, DOH guidance um, or public health guidance. Um, when they submitted that evidence, um, we did our own independent analysis and assessment of the costs. And as I mentioned earlier, that corroborated with the figures that they provided. Um, obviously, this is for that period looking back um, from March to September. Um, so this was an element for that period when lockdown restrictions were initially severe and then continued and continued to have an impact. So this was a contribution to the costs that they had provided. Um, now, the costs that they provided were based on, uh, they provided uh, yearly figures. So, um, as I say, our uh, analysis corroborated those costs, and then we based our uh, £1,500 on those costs. You've indicated that the £1,500 is largely going towards overheads, but there are different models within the industry. Um, there's the owner driver model. Where there is this HP 
costs that are continuing to be paid by the individual driver. There are other models where multiple drivers could be driving a taxi almost in a shift system where the taxi base owns the taxi and picks up all of that. So how did your model, how did your payment system take account of the different models that are out there? Well, the evidence that they provided recognised that um, there were differences, you know, amongst uh, drivers in circumstances. Um, so the information they provided were there were there was a range uh, and an average, um, um, and there were set or standard staple, if you like, um, overheads that applied to them all, and it was those overheads um, that we took in terms of. Um, uh, identifying uh, the payment. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the PSV one wasn't included because obviously that had been part of the uh, regulatory easements the Minister had already um, approved. Would you not accept there's a big difference in the overhead per driver depending on whether or not he owned the tractor and shared all the costs himself or whether those costs were shared with multiple drivers? Um, I think, as I say, you know, the industry provided the evidence um, um, and there was a range, um, and they provided an average. Um, so you accept. I mean, as Chris has pointed out, uh, you know, in recognising the, the hardship um, uh, s suffered and, and faced here, there has certainly been a push to expedite this and get money to the industry as quickly as possible. Um, to attempt to assess and analyse over 9,000 individual. Um, you know, it just wouldn't have been it'd be disproportionate and, and not value for money. So, as I say, we use the figures and the evidence that they provided to come up, uh, and the range they provided to come up with the basis for our uh, figure. Turning now then to, to the haulage industry, and you've said that there wasn't sufficient evidence. <clears throat> Would you not accept there's big diversity within the haulage industry, depending on what sector uh, the, the, the companies and the drivers were, were servicing? Uh, the food industry were actually busier during certainly the earlier period, whereas those servicing manufacturing it just died. There was nothing, and certainly the ferries significantly reduced uh, uh, their availability because of the lack of demand. So, would you not accept that there are huge variations, and why did you not attempt to pick up those areas of the haulage industry which had suffered heavily? Um, there are variances, and um, in fact, I, I believe that. Uh, so it, basically, there was, there, as I said, there were a number of range of sources that we looked at, and we do recognise that there are variations within on the individual uh, individual operators. <coughs> Excuse me, but there was that you look across the UK, and which took account, uh, which would have taken account of the fact that operators were initially, I think, having to deal with empty loads, but by and large they have now addressed that issue and they were able to share some of them were able to share costs. So all of that was taken into account in the round. There were there were I think parts of the haulier sector who looked after events hauliers, so people who were specifically um, looking after events and obviously mm -hmm. events were worked out. So they're being looked at separately, I think, by DFT. But um they were they're the only ones I think that have been identified separately. But as I said, we, there was the evidence looked at at a UK wide basis and the uh, and there, there wasn't the evidence to support the case. So while individuals I, I suspect possibly will be that's that that, that that did not form the basis for um for a, a sector-wide intervention, and they are, of course, also eligible to apply for the for, for the you know for the various schemes that were available. So, can you explain what the difference between the, the events hauliers and uh, hauliers who were perhaps servicing manufacturing industry that closed? Well, I, I mean, my understanding of it is, is and I, no, this is it's one that I did not look into depth into, is that um, people who are servicing um, businesses. Um, the, the businesses have picked up, whereas the events industry, I think, by and large, just closed completely. So, it's it's a it's a one I'm aware of rather than aware of the detail of. So it was just, yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Kelly. Hello. Uh, thanks very much, Chair, for letting me in. And um, can I just clarify that? Um, the scheme requires approval, but it has already been approved and supported by the executive parties, including the First and Deputy First Minister. And can I say I welcome the clarification around uh, the wedding limousine and, uh, if you like, the, those that would have done the, the parties, that they too can apply 
provided they hold the taxi PSV license. Um, and uh, obviously, um, there, there are old arguments as to when and who had the authority initially. Uh, it would have been the economy minister, but it has been made very clear by officials that um, that evidence was provided by both the economy and finance ministers of other support mechanisms that the industry uh, could have availed of and did avail of. But uh, can I ask the officials then, in terms of uh, comparison with other uh, jurisdictions, uh, particularly across in England, Scotland, Wales, what support has been given uh, to this sector? Um, uh, Which sector? Ta taxi sector or all of yes. them? Yes, taxi ta sector, yeah. Um, Thank you. Yes, we, we looked at um, other jurisdictions um, as a, as a <clears throat> comparator, and um, there has been no package um, of this scale being provided um, anywhere else, um, uh, either down south um, or across um, the rest of the UK. Um, the only um, other payment that has been provided by the Scottish Government was a £350 payment for PPE. So uh, this would be the most generous scheme of across the islands, but acknowledge uh, that for many people it falls far short of what their aspirations and indeed I'm sure their needs are um, uh, financially. Uh, but like many people affected by the economic consequences of the pandemic, uh, that's very regrettable. But I just want to say I welcome the scheme. I think the minister and her officials have worked hard to try to put a scheme in place where others failed. And uh, I would hope that the proposal here does get the support of the committee, as it has done already uh, with their executive colleagues. Okay. Is that, do you have another question? You can no, that's it. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Ms. Kimmins. Thanks, Chair, um, and, and thank you both uh, for, for the detail so far. Um, and I know others have mentioned around the haulage, the haulage sector. I suppose it's, it's bitterly disappointing for, for quite a lot. Um, I know myself and my, my colleagues have been engaging with them quite a bit over the last seven months. Um, and our most recent meeting was about four weeks ago. And you know we were quite optimistic that something was coming down the line because I don't think it's even fair to say there's exceptional circumstances. I think that this is the people are are, are at the wire here. Um, I know some of the the, sec the companies I've met with are literally hemorrhaging thousands of, of pounds. Um, and not seeing any reprieve on that, um, because you know a lot of the stuff they do, it, it's better at some times of the year, um, and unfortunately, the, the period where the pandemic uh, has hit would have been probably their, usually their their more busier period, um, and this time of the year would have been their quieter period. So they've had six to seven months now of little to no uh, trade. So you know, I think I think I would be asking that we we. We look at it again because I think what, what we'd we'd asked for was a bespoke package to try and uh, plug those gaps and try and provide some support um, for the people who have been really really badly hit. Because even with the self-employed support and things like that, okay, that may help some individuals, but for those big companies that have been um, crucial in in providing um, products and things over the years to to uh, us here in the north. Um, and providing all the things that we we want as consumers, um, you know, I think they're very much being left behind here. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's really really disappointing. And, and, and whilst there's been some uh, progress, I think it's been very slow to come. Um, and I just think that it's it's a huge issue, and, and, and I don't think it's right. I think that uh, whilst I appreciate there are there are elements of the haulage sector who have been very busy, and and, and that's great. But I just don't think it's good enough to 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 take a blanket approach to that and say that unfortunately there's not enough evidence because I think from speaking to even just some of my own constituency there's plenty of evidence yeah. there to, to say that support is, is badly needed and you know I, I, I really would have serious concerns about their future and how they, they um, recover from this because they're getting they're getting no opportunity to recover at all so 
that's all that's all I want to raise. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Uh, and just finally, obviously just in relation to um, the haulage industry, I know that from the um, the statement that the first and deputy first minister released on the twenty fourth of October in re- with regards to um, the support for taxis and coach operators that they had actually stated within that that they'd requested information from the from the infrastructure minister with regards to further detail in relation to her consideration of the impacts of the pandemic on the road haulage sector. Do you know if that has been shared? It has. Okay. Okay, thank you. No one else has indicated with anything further? No? Oh, oh Miss Anderson, did you want to come back in again? Chair, I think we, we need to um, be assessing what we've just heard in line with the information that we have received correspondence in the table papers today. For instance, Phonicab is telling us that they have spent 3.5 million during this pandemic. They used to have 1,400 drivers, and because of the impact it's had on them, they now have 748 drivers. So when I'm listening to Beverly and others saying that there was recognition of the hardship, um, and she also mentioned about we needed to ensure, they needed to ensure it was value for money and not disproportionate. I just can't equate here uh, 1,500 to the taxi drivers and particularly given taxi operators not availing of any of the support in the same way that bus operators and coach operators um, are going to be able to do going forward. So I know that speaking to many of the taxi drivers chair, they feel this is like go away and leave us alone money. Because Beverly, if you had been listening, and I know you would have been, to the industry and the drivers, you couldn't equate 1,500 with their hardship and their needs. Whilst it's welcome in the first instance, it's not enough. And uh, we do need to keep this on the agenda and go back and review it in line or line with the response, I think, from most of the people on this committee and with the industry and the drivers. Do you have any comments in relation to that? Just, I suppose, just Martina, just the, the, the points uh, I made earlier that <clears throat> operators were, um, as I'd highlighted, able to avail of those schemes like other businesses, um, other like businesses, so they weren't considered exceptional. Um, taxi drivers were, um, and this payment, as we've talked about how, how we came, came up with the payment, is. Um, an acknowledgement of that hardship um, and provides a contribution to those costs for the for the period in question. Um, just, I'm not sure about the the figures um, quoted by. Um, I think maybe you mentioned Phonicab, but I suppose some of these figures were were quoted to us as well. But these relate to uh, loss of income, and obviously, as we've talked about, the the scheme wasn't um, the intention of the scheme was not to. Um, you know, pr- provide coverage for, for loss of income. Um, it was to provide uh, a contribution to those costs um, that were not met by other schemes for taxi drivers. Okay, thank you. Anyone else at this stage? Just, just a quick Boylan? point, because at, at no point I, I didn't listen to any members won't say the word support in this scheme, and it's, it's welcome to the industry. Mm. The, the question is all about we have a role of scrutiny here. And the question said it has come back to us from the taxi industry. So I've asked Beverly already, and, and we, we will have to continue this, whether we write to the department or not, because in one hand we're getting evidence to suggest one thing, and in the other hand we're still getting lobbying from the taxi industry. So somewhere in between we have to find out exactly what the terms of reference were. We we'll support this scheme. We're, we're happy that, that there's a contribution we made, but there's question marks over how it and so and and one fine point here, because I'm at this point to what Chris said there, Chris said about uh, it was DFT's responsibility in terms of holidays. We're fighting here, and we've heard my colleague and many other colleagues ask questions about holidays. We're fighting for the holidays here, yeah. and we're, we're asking the department to look, whatever we, instead of saying, right, it's DFT's responsibility, and they haven't come to a scheme, or even for that matter, to make comparisons with other schemes across the water or anywhere else. You know, we fight hard for our people, our our constituents here in the industry here. That's the point I would like to make. Yeah. Just, just to clarify, Chair, um, so it, the assessment wasn't done on the basis that it was DFT's responsibility. It was looked at here. 
it was just part of the part of the wider set of evidence that was available to us. I appreciate the question, but it, it's just it we have a duty to, to try and represent our people as well. So. Mr. Muir? Yeah, just following on from what Carl was saying, uh, I think it's important, particularly around obviously the tax drivers, and I agree with regards to that, but the whole thing, I think we should be requesting what the evidence was and expressing our concern for lack of support, because a lot of these are family run businesses which have been built up over many years, a lot of money has been put into them, and not to have any support forthcoming is a matter of real concern for me. Yeah. Okay, um, Beverly, Chris, and Donald, thank you very much. You thank had you a sort of quiet you. session. Thank you, so, okay. thank you very thank you. much. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, members. So um, further, further to that, obviously there are still a number of questions to be asked of the department with regards to this, and particularly around the haulage sector, which obviously won't and um, doesn't impact on what we're, we're going to be deciding or agreeing today with regards to the statutory rules. But I think it is important that we do write to the minister in relation to that um, and get much more detailed information back, um, and perhaps then meet, uh, have a conversation or. Um, Make contact to um, the um, the representative bodies um, as well, RHA and logistics, with regards to the engagement that they had uh, and their understanding of of the situation and what they were led to believe um, during those discussions. Uh, just now, moving in respect to the the two stat, um, statutory rules, um, is there anything additional that you would like to add? Specifically with regards to that, or you can tell then I go through the processes of us looking to agree. Okay, so um, obviously then with regards to SL1, SL1, um, oh, taxi driver regulations proposed taxi driver support scheme. Um, the proposals for the scheme will focus specifically on the provision of financial assistance to taxi drivers, assistance provided in recognition of the impact of the pandemic on their trade. As we've heard, it recognises self-employed taxi drivers, um, the significant overheads, including additional PPE, which are not covered in the scheme, and the analysis is obviously to set the amount of £1,500 per taxi driver towards those financial pressures sustained during um, and as a consequence of COVID-19. Are members content with the proposals for that statutory rule? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Moving then to SL1 passenger transport regulations proposed private bus and coach support scheme. Um, these are there are approximately 200 eligible operators in the sector. The number of buses ranging from one to 44 per business. The scheme recognised the fact that the scheme was effectively switched off at the start of the lockdown, with operators having significant monthly standstill overheads <coughs> and excessive ongoing financial commitments. The Department for the Economy have confirmed that the majority of operators did not avail of the £10,000 and £25,000 business support schemes. The proposed scheme is based on the reserves that licensed bus and coach operators are statutorily required to hold to satisfy the requirement of financial standing. Financial standing requirements for bus operators for 2020 are £8,000 for the first vehicle and £4,450 for each additional vehicle for a standard licence. Are members content with the proposals for the statutory rule? Great. Okay, thank you. Um, further clarification then required with regards to um, wedding cars mm -hmm. and yeah. anything else at this stage? I, th I think to, to be fair and rise off the question as well. I mean, we need to know, you know, exactly what engagement, how they come up with the fifteen hundred pounds. That needs question needs to be asked directly. I don't think we got enough of it. Or what engagement there was across the full industry, the entire industry, to come up with that, because on one hand we're getting, and we've agreed the rule, which is grand, I'm happy enough, but there needs to be a question asked directly how that come about. I mean, I don't think we got enough. Well, there's clearly a small number of taxi drivers who were they were engaged with, but whether or not they were in agreement with well, that well, or not, we're I mean, not really clear. Well, either, if, so. if they agreed that, they're coming back to us today. There's a number of, there's a number of correspondence sitting in the system. So. Okay. Intent. Okay, moving then now to um, item um, number ten, which is our the briefing on permitted development rights. And you find that at page 
167, which is the Planning General Permitted Development Amendment Order Northern Ireland 2020 at Annex A, and at page 209, the Planning General Permitted uh, Development Amendment Order Northern Ireland 2020 Annex B. Uh, Hansard will be recording the session. I would like to welcome Angus Kerr, the Chief Planner and Director of Regional Planning. Um, Irene Kennedy, who is Head of Planning Policy Legislation Branch, and she is attending via Starleaf. And David Doherty, who is Planning Policy Legislation Branch. Um, you're all very welcome to today's um, meeting. Um, Angus, do you have, want to make an opening statement with regards to this, and then we'll follow up with some questions? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yes, that, that would be that would be great. Um, <clears throat> Thank, thank you for inviting us here today. Um, uh, you will have received the SL1, uh, which is setting out the Department's intention to, to bring forward a package of changes to planning permit development rights, um, and, and hopefully just take a, a little bit of time just to run through the four key areas of, of the changes. Just by way of background, the Planning General Permit Development Order 2015 sets out um, the types of development which can be undertaken without requiring a planning application, i.e. permitted development. Um, these are referred to as permitted development rights and <coughs> often relate to minor building works that have minimal impact to amenity and the environment. Um, from now on, I'll just refer to it as the GPDO. Um, so the schedule to the GPDO contains um, a whole series of parts, each of which sets out the various classes of development which can be undertaken without the need for a planning application. Um, and, and each part has quite detailed sort of conditions and limitations of what, what would constitute permitted development under the different um, classes of development. And it's important, I suppose, just to bear in mind in a conversation today that uh, you know, if development is not captured by these permit development rules, it simply means that it needs planning, a planning application. It doesn't mean that the development is, is unacceptable. It just goes through the planning application process and may well get approved or may well get refused. So, in terms of the process that we've we've been involved in for this for this particular these particular changes, it's been a bit of an elongated process, um, more elongated than usual. So, we consulted way back in 2016, and we had two consultations, one in May, um, where we con consulted on a range of um, proposals for permit development rights for um, electronic communications code operators, um, mobile phones, that sort of thing, um, non-domestic roof-mounted solar um, photovoltaic panels, solar panels basically, extensions to shops, financial and professional services establishments, and electric vehicle charging points. And then the second consultation back in, in 2016 was in December 2016, uh, where we consulted on um, in relation to permit development rights for mineral exploration. So, while the departments carefully considered the responses to the consultations, decisions on whether the changes um, should be taken forward were held um, pending the return of functioning assembly and a minister for infrastructure. So, in terms of the changes, as you're aware, on the 5th of October, the minister announced she wanted to bring proposals to the infrastructure committee for scrutiny to change planning rules um, that she be she believes will benefit business and the environment. In summary, the, the order um, will, will um, amend the, the general the GPTO by adding three new classes of development to Part Three, um, which is minor operations um, part. Um, which will expand permitted development rights to allow electric vehicle charging points, um, amend part 16, which is mineral exploration part, um, to remove permitted development rights for petroleum exploration, um, substituting part 18 um, of the schedule to expand the permitted development rights for mobile <coughs> network operators, um, and then finally um, part 34. Um, which is the, the, the part on shops, financial and professional service establishments, and that's to allow larger extensions uh, to premises under PD. The, the order also includes some, some other sort of small technical amendments and, and, and so on. You will have noted that the department is not taking forward changes to permit development rights for the uh, non-domestic roof-mounted solar panels at this time, and that's because um, the department is unsure that the permit development regime can adequately address the health and safety concerns raised by the airports, um, and considers uh, that it would be unwise to proceed, proceed um, so that they were raised as part of the consultation. The department currently believes that the safest option is to ensure that these developments actually do remain subject to the submission of a planning application. 
So running through the four areas, the order is slightly different um, uh, from the SL1, so apologies for that, but hopefully um, there's the four, four key headings which, which, which you'll have in your SL1. I'm going to start with mineral exploration, um, removing the PD rights for oil and gas exploration. Members will, be, will remember that the call for evidence and subsequent public consultation which took place for these proposals was really prompted by the, the controversy um, over the exploratory drilling which took place at Woodburn Forest in Carrickfergus. Um, and we consulted um, at the time on two options to remove um, permit development rights for oil and gas exploration. Option one was basically to remove all um, uh, PD for boreholes, for exploratory boreholes, and then option two was to remove um, PD rights for um, drilling of boreholes for, for petroleum exploration, but to continue to allow PD rights for development preparatory to petroleum <laughs> exploration. So essentially, that this would mean that um, some sort of more minor drilling of boreholes could be allowed. For example, for groundwater monitoring, seismic mon monitoring, and locating and appraising the condition of mines. Um, we also consulted on three other kind of minor amendments to, to the minerals PD rights at that time as well, to extend the 21-day period um, provided for councils to issue directions restricting permit development rights to 28 days. Give a little bit more time for that. Um, also introducing a new height restriction of 15 metres um, for mineral exploration uh, permitted development and then finally to provide a relevant period to ensure the permitted development right could not be exercised until the Council had fully considered the proposed development and decided whether or not to remove or restrict the right. The committee has been provided with a draft analysis of the responses to the consultation. In summary, the department received quite a large number, a big response to this one, 281 responses, and um, with 98.9% of response in favour of removing permit development rights for, for petroleum exploration. Um, and consultees were asked whether they um, would prefer option um, one or two, and 94.5 preferred the option one approach, which was to remove all um, PD uh, for all exploratory boreholes for oil and gas. There was general, also general support for the three minor amendments that I mentioned earlier. The Department, therefore, is proposing to bring forward amendments to the GDPO in line with option one, to remove um, permitted development rights for the drilling of all boreholes for petroleum, oil and gas exploration. This will bring Northern Ireland in line with the position in Scotland and Wales and also sort of lines up with the consultation responses received. The Department is also proposing to bring forward the three technical amendments which I mentioned. Uh, so proposing, uh, but the Department is proposing the height restriction for any structure assembled should actually be reduced from 15 metres to 12 metres. Uh, this change will keep visual impacts to a minimum, taking it into account the nature of the development, its temporary duration, and that any structures will be removed either within um, or at the end of the four-month pe temporary period which you get for permanent development rights for minerals explorations. Um, and this also aligns with the position in Scotland and Wales. So, turning now to the proposal to expand PD rights for mobile network operators, improving our telecommunications and digital infrastructure is vital to Northern Ireland's economy and society, and probably we would all recognise no more so than, than uh, what has come to light recently with the, the pandemic. Planning has a crucial role uh, to play in supporting the delivery of this infrastructure and facilitating appropriate proposals which deliver a high level of digital connectivity whilst ensuring provision of such infrastructure is cited and designed to keep environmental impacts to a minimum. Current PD rights provided to electronic communications code operators in Northern Ireland are significantly more restrictive than those currently provided in GB and the Republic of Ireland. The Department consulted on a range of proposals in relation to permitted development rights for telecommunications network development, proportionate increase um, in overall height and width of existing masts, apparatus and antenna um, to be mounted on buildings. So permitted development rights for, for that, an extension to the period for emer emergency temporary apparatus from six months to tw 18 months, an extension for the installation of new replacement telegraph <coughs> poles to include conservation areas, AOMBs and areas of special scientific interest, um, and also an extension for ancillary equipment housing subject to limitations to include installation in conservation areas, areas of outstanding natural beauty and areas of special scientific interest, national parks and listed buildings where listed building consent has previously been granted. 
These proposals would bring Northern Ireland closer to the positions in the other jurisdictions and are aimed at enhancing the ability of operators to undertake necessary works, such as replacing, altering or extending an existing mast, or installing a new antenna on a mast or a, bu bu or a building as quickly as possible without having to go through the planning process. At the time, the Department received 21 responses to this consultation, uh, and in general, respondents were in favour of the proposals, although there were some concerns raised by the airports around um, airport safeguarding areas. And as a result of that, the Department undertook further research and work uh, and engaged extensively with the airports. Following this engagement, the Department proposes to include an extra provision uh, in the legislation aimed at improving airport awareness of potential hazards. This proposed condition broadly aligns with a similar provision in Scotland and requires mobile operators to notify uh, the airport at least 28 days before development begins where the proposed development falls within the defined aircraft safety, aircraft safeguarding area of an airport. Um, subsequent to our consultation, a further issue arose in relation to this in respect of compliance with European Electronic Communications Code Directive, which is an EU directive setting regulatory frameworks for telecommunications. Article 57 of this directive refers to the planning rules surrounding small area wireless access points and requires these access points to be exempted from any individual town planning permits. Small area wireless access points are um, unobtrusive, small, low impact antenna, which would often be no lot larger than the size of a standard fire burglar alarm casing, but are potentially very beneficial to the rollout of 5G technologies. Currently in Northern Ireland, unlike the other jurisdictions, these small area access point antenna installed on buildings are not permitted development. However, the Department is satisfied that the amendments we're talking about here today and definitions um, in relation to small antenna will actually meet the requirements um, of the directive. Uh, the implementation deadline uh, for compliance with the directive is the 21st of December 2020. It's recognised that telecommunications and digital infrastructure is a fast-moving technological area, and we did um, consult on this uh, back in 2016. So, I mean, I would anticipate that this is an area that we probably will return to as a department, and indeed return to yourselves as a committee, uh, because there are already kind of um, other changes and, and, and developments uh, in, in this area that, that probably need to be uh, addressed. Shops, financial and professional service establishments, then, um, is the next area I want to look at briefly. The Department is committed to removing unnecessary legislative requirements and to lighten the regulatory load um, for shops um, and financial and professional services where appropriate and to bring such provisions into line with other jurisdictions. And this is even more important um, at the moment um, as businesses cope with the ongoing pandemic. The Department proposes, therefore, amending the existing permit development rights for um, extensions to shops, financial and professional service establishments by increasing the original um, floor space, uh, permitted development floor space from 25 per cent to 50 per cent of the original floor um, or of a shop or one of these services, um, or up to a max 100 uh, square metres, whichever is the lesser. Uh, in addition, the regulations will permit um, will introduce permit development rights for extensions to loading bays where the size of the original loading bay would not be increased by more than 20 per cent. The full, extent, the full range of existing safeguards and limitations to these PD rights will be retained, including that they don't apply in sensitive areas such as conservation areas, ASSIs, World Heritage Sites, and within cartilage of listed buildings unless consent otherwise granted. The majority of respondents to the consultation did not voice any objections to the proposed increases in permitted development rights for this category. Concerns, re concerns regarding the potential implications in existing sensitive areas are allayed by the retention of the existing safeguards and limitations, which I mentioned. Overall, the proposal will make it easier for business owners to make improvements to encourage expansion and innovation. This will be particularly helpful in relation to the current pandemic while ma maintaining safeguards protect neighbours and ensure development is of appropriate scale and character. Finally, and as I'm sure you'll probably be glad to hear, um, the Department uh, it, we're also committed to um, removing unnecessary legislative requirements to lighten regulatory burden for electric vehicle charging points. Uh, and this is important as we seek to reduce carbon emissions and address wider climate change challenges. The Department consulted um, on new permitted development rights for the installation of electric vehicle charging points in off-street parking areas only similar to those uh, which apply in, in England actually at the time. And these proposals were a volume limit of 0.2 cubic metres for wall-mounted charging points and a height of 1.6 metres for freestanding charging points. 
There was strong support for the consultation proposals. However, three additional points emerged. Um, one was that the department should facilitate the installation of the new rapid charging points, which requires to be slightly higher, 1.6 metres. And secondly, the PD rights should allow the replacement of existing on-street charging points, um, which weren't covered initially in the, in the consultation. And there are also some concerns raised about the impacts of proposals in, in um, World Heritage Sites and conservation areas. So the department agrees um, that the move to rapid charging points should be facilitated within the PD rights where possible. Therefore, it is proposed to allow freestanding chargers in car parks um, of up to 2.3 metres in height in non-residential locations. Um, and to protect the character of residential areas, a height limit of 1.6 metres will apply uh, in residential areas. In addition, the replacement of existing on-street charging points is allowed up to a height of 2 metres. Um, it is also proposed to allow a volume of 0.2 cubic metres for wall-mounted chargers in car parks. The um, Department agrees it is important to protect World Heritage Sites and Conservation Areas. However, not all elements of World Heritage Sites and Conservation Areas will necessarily contribute to intrinsic value and character. Off-street car parking areas tend typically to have lower visual amenity value and will often already contain items such as parking meters, um, which are similar in size and scale. Therefore, the Department considers it is unlikely that these charging points will have a significant negative impact on the character of a conservation area or a World Heritage Site and proposes that these rights should apply in the car parks in those areas. Overall, I think these proposals will assist in encouraging the growth of the electric vehicle charging market by making it easier to provide recharging infrastructure by removing regulatory barriers. This in turn will reduce carbon emissions, promote the use of renewable energy and contribute to the wider climate change and green carbon neutral agenda. Thank you. Um, <laughs> sorry that that was a bit of a, a, bit, a bit of a run through. It's just the, the four areas, but happy to take uh, take questions now. No, thank you, and, and that was very helpful. Um, obviously, this consultation did take place quite some time ago, and um, I remember quite well the issues in relation to Woodburn, and it had um, it created a lot of attention, uh, <coughs> and obviously protesters and so on involved in that. And not surprised that there were two hundred and eighty-one. Um, responses, but disappointed, obviously, in the in the other consultation where there were only 21 um, um, responses. Um, and I know that there, are, I mean, I suppose it's very difficult to, to anticipate how many people are going to respond to to various issues, and there will be things which will exercise um, some more that more than others. But um, there were some changes that have been made as a, um, from that consultation. Did you give any consideration to going out again on any aspects of that? We did. We did. Um, we gave quite a lot of consideration to that, um, if I'm honest. And I think probably the difficulty would have been <clears throat> you would have lost the the kind of the, the policy development work and the changes that we'd already kind of consulted on, and you'd have been kind of going back, starting from from scratch again, and, and reconsulting on, on on a range of new proposals. And I think it was felt, um, particularly in the the sort of oil and gas issue, was a sort of a standalone one-off issue. And it, you know, it could be dealt with and, and, and addressed. I suppose the telecoms one was the one where we thought, um, you know, it's a fast-changing area, technological change, and you know, industry, for example, we're pushing us to go further, and we're making points that um, actually the other jurisdictions have gone a little bit further already. Um, but at the same time, we, you know, they were concerned. Let's just get these uh, changes on the books as quickly as we can, and we were of that view as well in terms of actually, if there are changes that we're going to make, let's make them. And then we can come back to, to do some further work in the future. Electric vehicle charging points as well. We, we actually, the other thing I'm supposed to say about this is we were able to kind of update some of the changes that we've made. So, for example, one of the points that came out of the consultation is at the time is even more relevant now in terms of the, the you know, replacing the existing infrastructure that's there, which wasn't covered in the initial consultation, and also the rapid charging um, sort of consoles now, which are, which are coming through and, and being able to include those. So on balance, we felt that um, it was better to press on, get these changes made, and, and reap the benefits of them across the, the board, um, and then continue to work. Primitive development rights are kind of a, a never-ending, it's like painting the fourth bridge, there's constantly you know, changes in all the different areas that the people are, are, are looking for and, and wanting, either to make things more flexible or to, like the oil and gas issue, to, to pull things back. Yeah, and, um, you mentioned te telecommunications, and obviously there's a wide range of views in relation to that, um, and uh, I suppose that's not really for now for us to get in, involved in that, but um, clearly there are people who will have genuine concerns, 
particularly if they're living in the proximity of a mast and if you were getting to the stage now where you're increasing the height and, and also the width and that's going to happen um, within um, permitted development rights that will cause genuine concern from them and I know reading the responses to in relation to environmentally sensitive areas, areas of, not, of outstanding natural beauty as well, there are, are concerns. Uh, do you feel you've adequately addressed those issues? Yeah, I mean, we, we do. I mean, the, the, the permitted development right itself, um, you know, ha has always and will continue to have the, the notification requirement, uh, which is unlike, you know, most of the other areas of permitted development, um, where um, you can actually just go ahead and, and develop. If you feel you fit within the, the rules, whether it's agricultural or domestic for extension and so on, you can just go ahead and build it. You can go to council and get a certificate of lawful use and development to confirm it. But for, for telecommunications and actually for minerals, there's a requirement that you must notify the council in advance. Uh, and actually for the minerals one, we're extending that um, to 28 days. Um, but that's still in place for the telecommunications one. So th there is a, a genuine opportunity there for the councils to um, assess whether or not there's an issue um, with a proposal um, and whether or not it would benefit from um, going out and, and, and removing the permit development right and actually um, having a planning application coming in and that, so allowing for, for the consultation. And of course, it's, it's, it's still, there's no permit development right for new mass. It's, 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 you know, it's, it's for the expansion of mass or making them a little bit higher. Uh, and they're all kind of controlled and limited in, in, in terms of the rules that apply. So I think on, on balance, we, we've got it about right. We're still behind actually some of the other jurisdictions. Um, so in no way could we be, be seen to be sort of you know, trailblazing here and, and, and being very kind of uh, flexible um, you know, and even of concern to environment and community. Okay, um, and you mentioned obviously this is obviously a, a rolling piece of work. Um, can you give us an idea of what's coming next with regards to consultations and with regards to permitted development? Uh, um, well, we, we're, we're trying to get this, this over the line, obviously, first, um, and we have been lobbied about further changes in the telecommunications front. We haven't done an awful lot of policy development work. We just haven't had time on that. Um, there's no concrete plans at the moment to bring through anything anything else. Um, just, I'm just looking at Aaron here in case I'm, I'm, I'm missing anything, Aaron. But um, you know, we, we do get um, lobbied across a number of areas uh, through, through time, but there's nothing actually you know, anywhere near as advanced as this at this stage. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> Mr. Boylan. Mr. Thank you, Chair. I think it's your hop. We can't be your team's going all right the minute. Eh? Uh, you have a couple of questions, but uh, back to what the Chair said, and I think it's important. Um, in terms of the, the responses to the first consultation, and clearly I recognise that the second one was a specific, but um, it's something maybe we, even as a committee, um, was to see the council's response to it, and councils deal with a lot of community groups, and you would like to see that side of things. So maybe it's something we can learn by trying to get the message out right across the board. Um, ju just on that, um, there's a couple of things I want to ask them. Um, in terms of the minerals first, the the issue of PDs and the, the precious metals and all the fossil fuel, there's is there any other there's nothing in response to that. I mean obviously precious metals it's slightly different jurisdictional issue. There's there's nothing you want to comment in relation to any of that, no. Uh, well, we, we we consulted on um, the the kind of removal of PD rights for oil and gas exploration. Um, so sort of energy minerals, really, the non-energy <laughs> minerals, which is precious metals and quarries and that sort of thing. Um, we didn't include include in that, and for, for for lots of reasons, mm -hmm. really, the, the sort of size and scale of the, of the exploratory developments massively different. There's nothing at all of the of the scale and nature of Woodburn, for example, uh, for for that sort of thing. Sorry, no, just <coughs> see, see in terms, and, and obviously now with the the electric charge points. I mean, what were the barriers to that? Obviously, you now we're expecting an uptake because we're trying to move towards greener technologies and everything else. Was the barriers only the height or specific locations or? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it was it was well, it was a number of things. I suppose it was it's the size of the of the new units as, as they come through are are, are, are bigger, um, and also I suppose there's the point that um, we we had initially the right was built in for for statutory undertakers to 
in introduce electric vehicle charging points to the ones that you see, you, you know, that have been around actually for quite a while on the streets of Belfast, and um, we're all erected <coughs> under that um, uh, regime, but actually that has now gone over to ESB, so they're no longer covered for, for that, so we, we're, we're, we're building in um, a, a permitted development regime as part of this that allows that, that for them to be able to do that. Um, and, and just you know, there, there's 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 bigger machines to bring to bring forward the rapid charging. Um, I'd, I'd say the way you mentioned there, obviously in areas of A, O, and B, and yeah, I mean, we're, we're we're trying to encourage people to, to move to a different knowledge, but also use those places. I mean, the sensitivities around it. But I mean, you've indicated there there are areas we can facilitate that, and it needs to be as we as we move on, because those areas have to be supported once we get through the COVID. And those areas. Have, um, just the issue I see here, um, in addition to the three specific points I want to make, in terms of the the telegraph poles and sensitive areas. Now, I mean, obviously it was about it's mostly about replacement, but do you foresee um, a situation where there be an increase in new poles or? I'm, I'm not not aware of that specifically. I'm, I'm looking to, to, to David and Aaron here, um, because I think we, there probably would have been a little bit of lobbying about that, um, and, and it is just replacement. It is, well, the World Heritage Sites and Sites of Archaeology interest will remain, it's just the installation of new overhead lines supported by existing poles. That will remain in those two areas. There's some wider in, in other, the other areas. No, it's just, uh, I asked the question, because we know as we move forward, there's going to be Questions of what we want to progress, and there may be there may be different and different things happening. But I just want to just clarify that. The the other issue, obviously, is in relation to oh, the, the airport question. There's some issues raised. Is it are the airports now happy with some of the discussions you had? Were those changes there happy enough to? Yeah, think? yeah. So they, they, I think they welcome that sort of requirement that we have built in now that they're notified uh, if it's in a safeguarding area. And, and for the final point, and I know Alice moment, one in the 28 days notice to the councils, is that enough, or are you thinking of an extending that, or is that you're content with? Well, I, th I think I think we, we, we are content with that, um, and I mean I, I think probably back to the point you made actually at the start um, about the, the councils, and, and sort of I suppose I've talked quite a bit about this in here before. With the new two-tier system, there's a requirement, I think, on us now in the department to engage much more closely with councils. And yeah, as you know, I meet with the heads of planning regularly, and we, we are planning a, a bit of engagement around this, these particular permit development rights so that the councils fully understand them. And I think, if I'm honest, probably in the past, the, the system hasn't worked as well as it should work. Um, so we're, we're, we're going to put together a little bit of guidance for them that goes along with this, particularly around the telecommunications yeah. one that, that makes sure they're very clear on what their responsibilities are, particularly in relation to um, you know, airport safety and so on. Um, so yeah, uh, that's a good point. I think we, we, will, we will be doing that and um, making sure that they're fully aware of it and, and take it seriously and you know, assess these things within the 28 days now that they've got a little bit longer. for. No, and I think this is a good opportunity because Obviously, we're doing the review of planning, but some of the things arising from, from the system over the last five years have started to roll out. But there's opportunities like this, and like I say, certainly the, the consultation. I mean, the more people get involved and get a you know a proper informed view of what's going on out there, but um, and council have a role in that too. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, just two issues. The first one was just really picked up uh, by Carl in relation to permitted development rights that are already in place uh, for other fossil fuels and for the extraction of lignite and obviously we've talked about gold and precious metals but my, my issue is really um, well, what permitted development rights are in place really for those other fossil fuels and for the extraction of lignite and why they weren't included in the consultation because we declared a climate emergency in this place earlier on in the year and the <coughs> fact that there would be permitted development rights for the extraction of fossil fuels would be a concern, and the other ones around telecoms. But maybe we do that first one. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn to David in a minute, just to because he can go through. They're, they're they're pretty complicated, uh, you know. But maybe give a bit of a sense, David, of, of what the existing permit development rights are, because um, for, for minerals development. But essentially, um, I mean, fundamentally, the reason why we didn't consult on um, removing the permit development rights for exploratory drilling for minerals. It's because it's a, it's a very different beast to the exploratory um, work that goes on for um, oil and gas. 
they're, they're like sort of massive um, developments. Actually, you know, when you saw Woodburn, you, you know, I was horrified when I saw Woodburn to, to think that it might actually qualify for PD. I mean, that was an issue at the time, it's a debatable issue in, in a sense at the time. But um, I think we were moving, we were moving away. We wanted to move very firmly away from that. You know, they're sort of up to a hectare in size, massive drilling rigs, which are there for quite a period of time and, and going down very, very deep, deep levels. Whereas for um, you know um, non-energy minerals development, they're sort of small um, rigs which are driven in by a by a four by four jeep, you know, and maybe putting it in a field. Um, they're not that big. They go down, you know. Uh, I, probably David knows the, the you know how far, but not well, very far. They don't, they, won't, they don't go anywhere near as far as the yes. the petroleum or whatever. Now, the, the call for evidence that guided the consultation, it was raised about the other side of the minerals, and the department answered at that time why we weren't considering uh, and the reasons for not going for only going for petroleum. But again, the rights that are there at the minute, they are only temporary. They're there for four months, and they allow for the they, they drill boreholes, carry out a seismic survey, or make other excavations. And as I say, they are a temporary permitted development right, and consideration was given, and, and it is a much smaller scale for, for the other minerals. The other one, just around the telecoms and the changes around that. Will this bring us in line with the rest of the United Kingdom in relation to our sort of permitted development rights in relation to telecoms, or is there still much further work required? To well, I mean, England, England have just finished a further consultation and will be instigating further changes. Yes. Um, it brings us in line in, in certain aspects. In other aspects, there are still differences. Right. Um, when we consulted, it would have brought us in line with Scotland at that time, at that time. but Scotland have moved a bit further since then. Yeah. But it does bring it brings us closer. It brings us some in some places to the same and closer in other areas. Yes, but it's potentially something you're going to have to look at. Yeah, I mean these will be ongoing I mean, <coughs> telecommunications development. It's just going to be have to look at what's happening all over. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Anderson. Hello, Martina. Again. Do you want to ask a question? Yeah, no. I can't hear you. It from me. Yeah, there you are. There you are. I was trying to unmute and I kept uh, muting myself. Uh, Chair, you had asked a question in relation to the rolling program uh, of review uh, of permitted development rights uh, in the planning system. So I think we do need to return to that because I think it's a committee. We need to know what other permitted development rights. So I know you didn't get that question answered, but we can return to that. Can I pick up the question in relation to mining? Because, David, I'm conscious of what you said there. But you know, David, four months uh, permitted development window, um, I think is far too long because uh, just as Andrew has reminded us all, as if we needed reminded, I'm sure, but uh, given the climate emergency that we're in, a huge amount of damage can be done uh, uh, within four months. So I'm concerned about that and I would like to see that being brought forward, particularly in this rolling review that you're talking about. Yeah, um, I mean... We can certainly look at that, that going forward um, in terms of um, you know other areas of, of, of product development, right? I suppose one of the things um, that I would say is that not only is, is that sort of limited to the four months, there's also, I think, keep me right here, David, but there's, there's quite sort of strict requirements around reinstatement. Yes. Um, and don't forget that this is just ex exploration. None of this PD right applies to um, um, ex actual exploitation or extraction. Um, Purely for exploration, so so it's not you know it's there's small amounts of drilling that goes on for, for this. And David, we we've had the, the issue of exploration. And we know the damage that exploration can do, and um, when it moves on to exploitation, of course, uh, one would argue, and I would concur, that's further damage. So I'm I'm concerned about the exploration. Can I pick up on the point that has been mentioned by the chair and by Cahill and, and probably other members too? Uh, we need to try to maximise the engagement uh, with with uh, these consultations. You know, 21 responses. Obviously, Woodburn was a particular uh, issue that was exercising people with 100 responses. But that's the kind of responses that we need. So, what plans are in place to try to reach 
uh, out to people and whether there is a role obviously for council but we need to try to maximize uh, the engagement with uh, with the with these consultations and just to find out from yourselves if there are any plans in place to try to maximize the consultation process yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a key area for planning generally, not just for consultations on permit development changes, but generally across the whole planning piece. And the Minister has just has recently announced um, a new sort of partnership looking at uh, community engagement within the planning system and how to improve that. So it's one of the areas that we're looking at. It, it's constantly a, an issue as to how to kind of stimulate um, uh, engagement around some of the more, I mean, some of this stuff's quite technical sort of planning related mm -hmm. issues you tend to get quite right, you know, Woodburn, lots of people are interested and involved and, and brilliant response, but some of these areas are, are, you know, fairly kind of, you know, you get planning consultants tend to engage on it um, and planners. So we need to think, I think, a little bit more innovatively about how, how we do that. And certainly that's something that I'm personally very keen to, to, to really push forward. And, and I think it was something that will, will come out of that work that we're going to do on, on generally improving engagement around planning. Okay, okay thank you. Ms. Kimmins. Thanks, Chair, and, and thanks, um, Angus and David, uh, for the update. It's just, I suppose, one question, really. Well, uh, and one issue um, around where it states about councils have the power to remove uh, PD rights. Um, it's just to say, do, do you know if councils often use this? Um, do they record that, or how is that um, recorded? Um, um, under what criteria um, are they able to, to move permitted development rights, is, or is it at their discretion? Yeah, it, 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 it's not a, a massively used um, tool, um, I think, since since we, we've we transferred powers in 2015, there have been a few occasions, I'm looking at Harry in here, there have been a few occasions where where, we, where they've done that um, on different aspects of PD. Um, because, and the reason we know that is because there's a role for us in um, sort of like confirming that uh, process yeah. when it's being done. But I suppose it, it, it isn't something that um, is, is probably massively used and it might be something that councils could um, look to using a little bit more uh, as we go forward. You know, it tends to be, and for example, I think France used it re recently within a conservation area where they removed um, permitted development rights, you know, for sort of domestic extensions and that sort of thing, so that to protect the integrity of the conservation area. Um, uh, and it has been done in minerals as well. Uh, I think there was a, the, the old one from Anna Council, Irene, uh, did yeah, it a couple right. of years ago. Yes, um, yes, Angus, that's correct. Um, we've had two. Uh, conservation areas in Belfast, uh, in, in Malone and Adelaide Park, have moved permitted development rights, uh, and also in Fermanagh and Oma, in, in relation to mineral exploration. Okay. That's fine. Well, that's it. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Buchanan. Thank you. Uh, mine's of just a simple question in relation to relates to land. You know, mineral rights on land. What's the position, or who controls water, whether it be the edge of the coast or the Loch Ness? Is there any permitted development there? So if I wanted to get to Loch May to do that, who control, is that you controls that or who controls that? Yeah, I, I mean, there, there's marine, uh, the marine licensing regime is obviously for the sort of anything that would be happening um, off the coast, but um, within uh, Loch May, I think it's covered by the terrestrial planning regime, so these permitted developments would apply to that. So it covers that as well? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's it. Thank you. Mr. Beggs? Uh, just uh, a word of support uh, in terms of removal of the permitted development rights for the Petoran exploration, and you've mentioned Woodburn. I, mean, I think any council or planning authority that would have granted uh, exploration for a, a drilling rig in the catchment area of a reservoir would be, uh, frankly, laughed at, mocked, a uh, complete lack of protection of the water supply. So I could not see that having happened if there were uh, if there had not been this this case that is there where they had the permitted development rights to proceed. So I, I think it's, it's essential that that is removed and that is not repeated anywhere else in Northern Ireland. So I'm supportive of what you're you're doing. Okay, thank you. Um, no one else has indicated for any supplementary so thank you very much for attending this morning and for thank you. Um, for sharing a lot of information. <laughs> The joys of primitive development. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Cheers.
Okay, so Reversal 1, the Planning General Permitted Development Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2020. The rule is subject to the resolution procedure in the Assembly. Um, the Planning General Permitted Development Order, Northern Ireland 2015, sets out types of development which can be undertaken without requiring a planning application. The Department undertakes a rolling programme of reviewing permitted developments in the planning system to ensure that they are up to date and fit for purpose. The um, proposed legislative amendments are outlined in more detail in the SL1. Um, the order um, include, also includes a small number of technical amendments. Are members content with the proposals for the statutory rule? Yeah. Okay, agreed. Thank you. Moving then to um, item number 12, which is the departmental briefing on driver and vehicle agencies. Agency including um, MOTs, lifts and driving tests. I'll refer you to page 253 of the briefing paper. Hansard will record the meeting. We have until 1 p.m. I understand um, for this session. Um, we welcome um, Judy Thompson, the Deputy Secretary, Planning, Safety and Transport Policy Group, and Jeremy Logan, the Chief Executive of DVA. Um, you're both very welcome, and congratulations, Jeremy, on your your appointment. Thank you. Um, if you would like to make your presentation, I'm not sure which one of you will be doing that, but. Okay, thank you. And thank you for the invitation to come to the committee today to provide an update on DVA services. Um, and this follows obviously the previous update, which was provided by the Minister at the start of September. And we've obviously given you a briefing paper. And I just want to draw out a few points from the paper on the current position on DVA services. And then Jeremy will say a few words about the plans looking forward. So there's been, as you know, an understandable impact from COVID-19 on DVA services, as has been the case with many other public facing services. All processes have been risk assessed and the safety of our staff and customers remains the top priority. This has meant that capacity has been reduced, the number of staff and customers within the test centres has been carefully controlled and sanitisation and social distancing is in place. We know that this has led at times to inconvenience for customers at an already very challenging and concerning time. Um, in terms of where we're actually at, in terms of MOT services, testing is taking place in all 15 test centres for vehicles that are unable to avail of TECs. That's taxis and buses do a first-time test, vehicles not previously registered in Northern Ireland, vehicles whose MOTs have expired by more than 12 months, that includes vehicles previously declared SORN and those sold by car dealerships, MOT testing for four-year-old cars, motorbikes, three-year-old light good vehicles and heavy goods vehicles and trailers resumed from the 1st of September. All other vehicles are receiving TECs and the capacity available in our test centres is able to meet the demand for those MOT tests so that all the vehicles can be kept safely on the road. As you are aware, driving instructors were included in the executives' regulations and businesses that must close until the 13th of November to help spot, stop the spread of COVID-19. And following this executive decision, the driving tests have also been suspended over this period of increased restrictions. Motorcycle lessons and tests are unaffected by the new restrictions. Given the reductions in service provision, a bid was put forward to the Department of Finance in October monitoring for a further £12 million to address the estimated remaining loss of income in DBA for 2021. Unfortunately, the Department only received £10 million against our total COVID pressures of some £36 million from October monitoring, and the Minister is considering the allocation of this funding at this time. So any remaining shortfall will need to be addressed and considered as part of January monitoring. Um, I'll hand over to Jeremy and he can take you through the plans for particularly on driving tests over the next few weeks. Okay, thanks Julie. Uh, following the decision to suspend driving tests, we took immediate action to contact those affected customers, cancel their tests and refund their fee. Uh, we also met with the Northern Ireland Approved Instructor Council and wrote to all uh, approved instructors to notify of this uh, position at the earliest opportunity. The booking service remains closed. We have identified that over a thousand key workers and customers who had their driving tests cancelled from late March to the end of June fall within this group uh, who had their tests cancelled due to the current restrictions. We are planning to provide this initial priority group with advance access to the booking system from the 9th of November to allow them to reschedule their appointments before it opens to the remaining customers whose tests were cancelled. To create additional capacity, we are planning to open up the booking system for February for these impacted customers only. In addition, approximately 2,000 further appointments will also be made available in November, December and January as we increase our capacity by recruiting additional examiners. These slots, when they are released, 
will also only be available to those impacted customers. Once all customers who had their tests cancelled have had the opportunity to rebook their appointments, we will open up the booking service for all other customers. Once driving test services resume again, we will continue to offer driving tests on a Saturday. And following consultation with key stakeholders, we are planning to offer driving tests for heavy goods vehicles on Sundays where it is suitable to do so without comp- compromising the integrity of the test. We will also use overtime to roll to off shift dual role driving examiners to provide additional capacity and to provide cover for scheduled driving tests where, due to a variety of unforeseen reasons such as sick absence or the requirement to self isolate, driving examiners may be un- unable to attend work. We know that learner drivers are keen to take their driving tests at the earliest opportunity and we acknowledge their frustration has been further compounded by the current suspension of driving tests. We are working hard to maximise the availability of test slots across all our test centres. However, the COVID restrictions mean that we have had to adapt our services to ensure they can be provided safely and we would ask our customers to remain patient at this difficult time. We will, of course, keep this position under review. And we are happy to take any questions you may have today. Okay, thank you very much. And, and obviously, when we had scheduled this briefing, it was really to get an update on um, sort of the restart and how you had been progressing then through um, the, the very large backlog at that stage. And obviously, now the, the, the restrictions that we currently have now have, have put that back even further, which is which is disappointing, um, but obviously understandable. Julie, if I can take you back to the meeting in February um, when the drama was unfolding at that stage, just in relation to the cracks on the MOT lifts, and we all got ourselves terribly excited about that and obviously unaware of what was coming down the track in, in a very short period of time. But at that stage, we'd heard that DVA had a very healthy um, reserve of £36.9 million. Pounds. And it was detailed at that stage that £17 million had been set aside for the development at Hyde Bank, £3 million for a new booking system, £11 million for equipment, and there was £6 million pounds contingency. And we were also told at that stage, obviously, that DVA um, would have anticipated somewhere in the region between three or four million pounds then coming in in order to um, replenish or to um, add to those reserves. Obviously, things have changed quite dramatically during that period with the suspension of MOT um, as a consequence of the lifts and obviously then the purchase of the lifts and then the issues around, around COVID. Um, you did mention, obviously, there's going to be a request for a further £12 million pounds in your paper to um, DOF, but could you maybe take us through the, the financial situation as it currently stands, particularly with regards to those projects um, and where you see it moving forward? Okay, and I think, yes, it, it starts, I guess, from the time of the lifts, as you rightly point out, and then, and then moving forward. Um, the 12 million, just to, to clarify what I, what I said in the, in the opening remarks, was to bring you up to date. So we did make that bid to DOF as part of October monitoring, um, as part of the 36 million pounds that the committee would be aware of for October monitoring, and we've received 10 million back. So an element of that might go to, to DVA ministers considering um, where, where to allocate that 10 million. In terms of the actual reserves position, the the DBA has enough cash, okay, so it has enough reserves for 2021 to be able to make payments, and I think that's the most important. If you, if you boil everything down, cash flow was obviously exceptionally important. Um, Minister put an extra £10 million pounds from DFI Capital uh, as part of the funding for Hyde Bank. Uh, if you recall that element of it, and we also received 7.3 million from, a, from an earlier COVID allocation. So that 10 million, the 17.3, were both put in in order to help rectify uh, part of the des- the deficit. Um, that's left us with the 12. So 10 million for High Bank, 7.3 additional income, leaving a gap of 12 million now arising as we look at that, and that's a forecast to the end of the financial year. So that's a fully encompassed as best we can do it, and it is it is very challenging. Um, it's the MOT testing that is the biggest driver on on DBA accounts. That 12 million pounds. Um, so we will obviously then put that back through, uh, or whatever extent of that remains outstanding. Um, back through into a January monitoring process, which obviously is yet to happen. Um, we do expect the trading fund to be in deficit. It is supposed to break even one year with another, and it's highly unlikely, well, 
virtually impossible that that could happen at this point. Um, and that will have to be looked at then with, with the auditors around what does that mean, uh, breaking even one year with another. You're absolutely right. Nor in normal circumstances, DVA would make a small surplus, maybe three, four million pounds a year. Um, and does taking one year with another allow for that effectively to rectify itself, although it would take some time? Um, if the £12 million isn't provided, then effectively it will make purchasing, particularly the capital equipment that you talked about, into the future problematic, um, very problematic. Um, and that's where the relationship between January monitoring, what might need to happen with DFI capital funding, um, and budgets in general for 21-22 will need to all be at play. So it's a slightly different thing from a normal kind of part of the department's funding. It's because of the trading fund relationship that you can um, look at DBA as it stands. £12 million is a lot, and we need to, to get that addressed. And if it isn't addressed in January monitoring, then there may be implications for 21-22 in particular about what the, um, DBA can actually afford to deliver. Okay. I'm just in relation then to the contribution with regards to the, the lifts and so on. You know, how is that impacted on on budget? So the lifts were paid for. They, that was 1.8 million. That's already been subsumed it within the uh, figure work within the DBA. So that's effectively already accounted for in 2021. Okay. But as you say, it has been dwarfed by the, yeah. the loss of income so that has then happened since then. Yes. Um, so the, moving then through to uh, the MOT testing, obviously you've talked about to sort of reduce capacity and so on as well. Um, what does that actually look like then on, on, on the ground with regards to, um, to staff and, and also within the centres themselves? Well, vehicle testing services have resumed at all 15 uh, MOT centres. Um, they have been unaffected by the, the current uh, lockdown restrictions. And as, as Julia has identified, we're continuing to manage the, the, the temporary exemption certificate process uh, along with the other vehicles that uh, we have identified that are being brought forward for test. I mean, it's uh, obviously a major impact of, of, of us on fee income. If we, the more vehicles we bring in, the more fee income we, we generate, and obviously that uh, improves our, our financial status. So at the minute, uh, we'd identified previously that we're working at approximately a 30% capacity, but we know that we will have to increase that as we move into January, February, and March, as uh, some of those TECs come to uh, their natural 12-month expiry. So, uh, in terms of uh, the change in position since we were last before you know, in September, um, the driving examiners or the sorry the vehicle examiners are now back um, in their full shift patterns um, at all MOT centres. And the next thing that we will have to look at is reducing the duration of the test. Uh, currently, uh, the test is for 30 minutes for a normal car. We want to try and bring that back down to increase our capacity to allow more vehicles to come through all our centres. At what point do you think you anticipate doing that? Well, we're gradually doing that at the minute. Um, um, certainly, bringing back the the examiners through their, their full shift that is now in place. And as we look to see how quickly we can deliver a test um, based on the information that we have already accounted for over this last couple of months, in terms of how long does it take to do the test with those additional controls, and we believe that we can reduce that period of test from 30 minutes down to 25, certainly initially, and we will be aiming to bring that um, back to towards 20 minutes, which is the normal test time um, for a vehicle in our in our test. Okay. I obviously appreciate that obviously the risk assessments and so on that have been taken into consideration to protect staff and, um, and customers. Um, there have been a number of um, complaints in relation to um, you know, customers having to wait outside, um, particularly for prolonged um, periods of time, particularly if they're involved in sort of good vehicle testing, which would be a much longer test and could be there maybe three or four times in the day, depending on the, on the, on the business that they operate. Um, what um, measures are putting, putting in, being put in place in order to protect those particulars we're going through um, into the winter period? I think it's, a, it's certainly a well understood issue. Um, we had a range, so we have the customers from the vehicle testing and then obviously there was also at, at the point there was driving instructors as well who were also similarly coming up to uh, the centres and wanting shelter as well. Um, I think as Minister described when she was here in September, this is difficult because you still have to maintain all the social distancing and, and making sure that that risk assessment that you're doing for COVID isn't then um, replaced by further risks about having more people within the building itself 
potentially able to access things and causing other hazards, if you like, in, in terms of, of where they're at. It's been, the, the, the answer to this has been looked at on a local basis and where people can be accommodated within the, the fabric of the building, they will do so. So the reception areas were being opened up, but they can obviously only take a certain number of people. So there's an element of, I guess, we can't do everything for everybody. Um, and the, the risk assessment guys are very, very conscious that um, in bringing people inside the test centre, if they can't be managed safely, they are better outside for their own safety, and, and we apologise obviously for that inconvenience to them. But we can't afford to be bringing them in in an unsafe manner, whether that be for COVID reasons or for just simply because of the machinery and, and all the other moving parts within the test centre. So, but I would provide assurance that where it can be accommodated locally, it is being, and it certainly has improved from where it was. Um, they've made inroads into that. Okay, and just with regards to the, the recommencement then of, of driving tests, do you anticipate that taking place from the 14th of November? Obviously, it's subject to what comes from the executive with regards to um, restrictions. Well, certainly subject to the executive's decision, uh, driving tests are still booked in the system from the 14th of no November onward. And as I've said, our plans are to uh, offer uh, appointments for those customers that were affected uh, in this last four weeks who had their, their, their test uh, cancelled to reschedule their appointments from the 9th of November, looking at that first priority group of the 1,000 who were key workers and uh, customers who had their test cancelled previously. So this is essentially the second time their, their test has been cancelled, but we are going to give them uh, advanced access to that system and our plans are to do that from the 9th of November. Okay, uh, and there, there was a concern, and I know that this is a Northern Ireland Civil Service wide concern with regards to holiday entitlement, and obviously everyone's entitled to holidays. Um, just during this period of time, um, are um, examiners being redeployed or are they sort of a mixture between redeployment and, and maybe taking holidays? Can maybe give some um, view on that as to what that, what the current situation is with regards to that, because there was a concern that perhaps that if examiners then were taking their holidays then towards the tail end of the year, that that then may have an impact then on test availability. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly it's uh, it's an issue, as you say, right across the civil service in terms of the concerns of, of, of accrued annual leave, particularly through the, the COVID restrictions. Um, we have been encouraging staff to take annual leave, um, particularly those staff that are working from home. And in this particular context with, with driving examiners, um, we have been encouraging them to take annual leave during this four-week lockdown period, but uh, we cannot enforce that or make that a, a mandatory requirement. Uh, there is a limit to what driving examiners can do in this period um, where they're, they're their job is driving exam, and there's very little more that we can do to redeploy them. Uh, that said, some of the driving examiners continue to do the motorcycle tests, and they're continuing throughout this four-week period. So, where possible, say we will try and get staff to use up some of their leave. But again, we're we're doing that on request, and we cannot make that a mandatory stipulation to do so. Okay, thank you. I, ha I have loads of questions, but I have to share, unfortunately. So <laughs> I'll move into um, Capper Boylan. Thanks, Chair. I think you've asked most of them already. <laughs> You're very welcome, Jeremy. Good luck on the post. Um, just, just a couple. Of, just in relation to actually the lifts first. I mean, in that obviously the last report we got was on the 31st of August. Yep. It was 18 out of 23 actions. Where are we now in terms of the whole lifts issue? All the um, uh, well, I, I guess we'll do another update, um, and we publish it again on a quarterly basis. So we'll keep working at that. Um, you can tell by the action plan that a lot has actually happened. Um, at the, we have obviously all the lifts back operating, which is, is what we've been discussing, and many of the contract management type issues have all been addressed. Uh, inspection and maintenance has been addressed, um, and you're really some of the some of the issues will be ongoing for a long time, if you like. In that, there's a couple of them to do with monitoring, and that will continue. So at some point, we'll have to, and um, you know, there's a couple of them at least are in the in the in the five that have not are supposedly not addressed, and yet they are they are well in process. So there's there's um, the vast vast bulk of it has actually been put put through, um, and. The ones that are outstanding are very nearly there. I mean, it, it has been a big piece of work to get put into place, um, and it involves obviously working with Maha and working through the contracts um, and inspections ongoing on those new lifts and getting that regime well in place. But um, we have good confidence around it, and that we're pretty much we're pretty much there. And we will publish again the next report, which will be um, October, September. November, November. Apologies. Thank you. 
Um, Joe, just back to Tess, obviously, um, just trying to get <coughs> figures itself, and I understand it's been difficult. I mean, is, is how many actually, even in this circuit breaker, what are we looking? You said there was a thousand there from March, as it's done in terms of over the last four weeks. I'm just trying to get a, an overall figure in terms of, you know, you mentioned, I think, 2,000 there. Is, is, that, is that the bottom book figure in terms of you have sitting in the system from now to, to uh, where you said, allocations up to January, slots up to January? Is that well, well, we believe um, there was 2,500 uh, tests cancelled, car tests cancelled in that four-week period. And I say that uh, subset of that of just over 1,000 for those sort of key workers and previous um, uh, folks that had their, their tests cancelled. Um, leaves uh, approximately another 1,300 or so, uh, 1,400 or so that um, will have had their tests cancelled for the first time, and we will pre be prioritising their bookings for them. So, I mean, in terms of going forward, the, the 2,000 figure I mentioned in the opening remarks is the additional capacity that we believe that we can make available from the middle of November uh, out to the end of January, and that does not include uh, opening up slots for February at this stage, which we haven't done. Um, and we've been able to release those additional slots between November and January based on the recruitment of, of new staff and, and, and making sure that the templates at those um, test centres have been uploaded uh, and are ready for those slots to be booked um, once the, the service reopens. So that's where that 2,000 That's the additional on top yeah. of what we have. To, yeah. And what's the figure we have to do pre the slots? The well, we, say, we, we believe that there was about 2,500 cancelled in that four-week period. That's we think four. that we can accommodate the vast majority of that with right, the okay. slots that are available up until the end of January, but we will open then February slots as well right. um, to take any of the additional uh, capacity there. No, and, and see, um, well, obviously, I know myself and many other members have been, have been lobbied by people now, especially you know, looking at the tests. And see, and I'm, I'm not making one rule over the other because I know that people are sitting there. But, but obviously there's people out there who are job dependent, you know, in terms of getting the test. I mean, I'm just wondering, is, have you looked at that side of it or, or is it, and I appreciate people that have been on the system and they're entitled to go, but, but I know I've been contacted by people who are job that, dependent. I think that, uh, that the first group, which is the thousand that Jeremy was talking about, includes key workers. Okay, so okay. there's a lot of key workers. So that 2,500 number is the total number that were cancelled for the four weeks. Yep. And of that number, a thousand of them are either key workers or, or were sitting having already had their, their tests cancelled from March to June. So they will all take priority yep. and will be accessing the system on their own, nobody else allowed into the system until they have been able to access well, it. I, I and that, 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 that all helps, I think. To and then that rolls on, you know, because yeah. I, yeah. I, I know and I've said this before in the committee, I know that make a play for the rural one because rural people are definitely dependent on, on transport because they, they don't have the public service but I you know, appreciate the figures. And I, th I think when we introduced um, the driving test initially and, uh, on the 1st of September for the key workers uh, and, and those who had their tests cancelled, uh, we continued to process key worker requests mm. throughout September and then when the booking service opened on the 5th of October, I mean it, it becomes uh, very difficult to administer and manage um, processing those priority requests, so that stopped when the booking service opened for all customers at that stage. No, no, appreciate it. I'm, I'm not making, I'm only making the point, I'm not saying one person over the other in case anybody says they want the test before key workers, but I appreciate the update, yeah. Okay, thank you. And just during that period um, that you know, testing or driver tests recommenced, how many tests were carried out before we went into lockdown again? We had the figures um, for uh, September, I say you'll appreciate, and I know that it does cause some frustration that we're tied into the official publication of, sta of statistics, uh, but the st statistical reports, and we've agreed now that we'll publish these on a monthly basis because we know that there's a lot of interest in, in these figures. Uh, for September, uh, they identified that there were 2,821 tests conducted, now that was across all categories. I would caution that uh, September is probably not a good month to assess our capacity because we were dealing in an ad hoc way with those requests and having to contact those customers. And equally, uh, Craig Avon Test Centre didn't open until the end of the month, so those figures are probably not a good barometer of how um, the figures will look going forward. Okay, thank you. Mr Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, just a couple of things. See, in terms of the, the temporary um, TEC, <laughs> Um, how long is it, can that be valid? What's the maximum length of... Or? 12 months. Right. Okay. So this pandemic kicked in in March 
and uh, there's no there's no light here at the end of the tunnel. So, what are the legislative options here in terms of the potential need to extend this? So, obviously, that's a matter that's going to affect everywhere. Um, we have the the lifts issue coming in from January, and as, as Jeremy's already. Um, advised. We've, we've been looking forward to January and can, uh, fate can see that how we can manage capacity and demand through that period, January through to March. Once you hit the end of March, everybody, because that's all part of the one set of regulations, the one set of legislation across, across the UK, um, now we will then need to consider does it matter whether we're part of the EU or not, and does that change anything and provide any further latitude? Um, but what I would say is Northern Ireland is going to be in exactly the same position as everybody across the UK, so whatever solution needs to be put in place, um, we are very, very cognizant that March is not that far away, and we need to be running at 100 per cent capacity to enable the, uh, to the cars to move through. But it, it's a matter that's going to have to be looked at across the UK, I would think, to, yeah. to, to, and, and indeed not even just that. It'll be the whole of Europe is in the same situation. And just the issue for me is that we, we just don't know where the situation is, and when we look at the, our health service and the, the, yeah. the pressure it's under, and uh, the safety of everyone has to be paramount. So, you know, the, everyone's talking about the 13th of November as if that's you know us sailing on, you know, everything's moving on. That's not going to be the case. You know, and we have to be able to budget for the fact that we may not be able to resume MOT testing, and yeah, and, and, as I say, and also suspend there, it again. There are. That I think will be a problem across multiple countries in yeah. terms of how do you deal with that. And the law, as it currently stands, says you can only get it for 12 months. And um, you know, by the time it comes back round again, they will need to be tested. So yeah. that's it's a um, it's a big problem that will need to be resolved. Just a couple of other things, just around the fees. Obviously, that was you didn't get that money in the October monitoring round, and you're going to look for it in January. The resource pressures upon the Northern Ireland sector are quite significant uh, around that. If you did not get that money, would the increasing of fees for MOTs and driving tests be an option to be able to? Uh, is that something that is on the cards? Um, it is not on the cards, but you would have to examine where you are at that point and how you get back to a, a position of balance. Um, but it is not something we are planning for at this stage. We would obviously rather it is resolved through, you know, through a January monitoring round, um, and then we will look at the figure work at that point, um, figure out cash initially, and then into trading fund balance. But it's, it's, you are right, it is an option to generate uh, more income, but it is not actively being considered at this point. Okay. Oh, just one other issue: the approved driving instructors. So they have been contacting me because they have not been able to go through their uh, tests. And I don't know, well, can you an update on that? Because I know that there's been progress in that across the water, but not here. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there there is an issue with some of those extended uh, driving tests. Now I know they are approved uh, driving instructors are very uh, unique um, tests, and it's conducted by our own supervising examiners. Um, so we are looking at further measures to mitigate against the risk of someone being in a car for upwards or and indeed more than an hour to see if there's any other additional controls that we can put in place in, ter in terms of a risk assessment. But we are working. We realise that there is pressure uh, on approved driving instructors and indeed some other uh, sectors, and we are hopeful that we will be able to reinstate those services, and that's certainly what we're working to do, to reinstate those services as soon as we can once these current restrictions lift. Um, so that, that is, that is, is there any definitive timescales in that? Because I'm just conscious this has been drifting for quite a while, and I, that there, people contacting my office regularly, sort of going looking for an update and when about this is going to resume. I, 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 I can't give you a definitive timescale today, but what I would say is that we are in close contact with the, the Driving Instructor Council and Driving Instructors, and as soon as we have that date, we will communicate that immediately with them. But I am confident that it will be uh, sooner than later. Um, we, we have made significant progress on the delivery of the, the, the driving tests, and unfortunately, this four-week lockdown has impacted that slightly. Um, however, we are confident that we will be able to deliver that service very soon. Just one last thing. It's not a question. It's more of a statement, really. But um, the, the impact of all of the MOT situations had upon car garages and mechanics across Northern Ireland has been quite significant. And if you were speaking to them, their downturn in trade. They had an initial upsurge after the initial lockdown, and then it's also and there's also concerns around road safety and about people keeping their vehicles in a proper roadworthy condition. And I think it's a point that is to be 
made today is that whilst MOTs are suspended and there's delays associated with that, people have a responsibility to ensure that their car is in roadworthy condition because there is concern around that. Absolutely, yeah. and I couldn't have said it better. Yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you, Mr. Beggs. Um, you've indicated that a thousand key workers have had their driving tests cancelled. Uh, we, we expect we need them to be able to work whatever hours are needed to do unsociable hours where there won't be public transport, etc. So, how is the balance determined about the risks of key workers not being able to do their job and the risk associated with them doing a driving test? The, um, the thousand includes not only key workers but includes anybody that had their test cancelled between March and June, so the key workers will be a subset of that 1,000. Um, in terms of balancing risks, uh, you go back to the executive, the decision taken to, risk, to take uh, driving instructors at the executive and to put, include them as part of the current restrictions, and that left obviously then driving tests in the same position as driving instructions. So it will depend on what happens at the executive and their balancing of whether driving instruction should continue or not. Um, now, our assumption is that it is all resuming again from the 14th of November, but obviously that's a matter for the executive to weigh up in the round about everything else, and we will follow, obviously, any executive instruction. <coughs> but I, I simply wish to highlight that there are bigger, health, bigger implications once you uh, stop the tests and you may actually restrict nurses' ability to work extra shifts. I may even come down to that. This is actually quite important and it should not be just lumped in, oh, let's stop doing driving tests. I think it needs to, the, the, the whole needs to be considered and I would ask that that would be fed through the system going, going forward. Now, in terms of the total backlog, I haven't heard what the latest assessment of the total backlog is and when you expect to be uh, uh, caught up to date again because the system was swamped when it briefly opened and all the, the, the three months booking slots were taken. What assessment have you of the numbers of those wishing to take driving tests that haven't even been able to go on the system? How many additional uh, uh, learner drivers are out there do you think are waiting to book? So I guess there's, there's multiple layers of that. There's the 2,500 that we know about were cancelled, obviously, for these four weeks. You're right, um, not everybody would have been able to avail of appointment up to January. And if this hadn't have happened, we would have been opening up February and accommodating um, a significant portion of those. Meantime, then, theory tests have also been continuing. Um, so, it, you know, the bottom continues effectively to be populated by more new learners coming in who will have been, in the meantime, have been passing the theory tests, and that has continued. Theory test centres have remained open um, over the four weeks with social distancing in place. Um, so, I think what we can do and what we can control is opening up the capacity as far as possible. So, that involves, as Jeremy points out, um, putting in place the extra slots for November, December and January, bringing in extra driver examiners, um, using the dual role people. We will, at the minute, they're obviously all working in MOTs. When driving tests reopen, we will put them on to uh, driving examination. Um, and we will just have to work through it on that, on that basis. It's the same across the UK. Um, so we know that Wales is closed for the two weeks. England will close their driving tests for the four weeks. Scotland is doing very few driving tests, as we understand it. So the position here is the same as elsewhere, and there are, yes, people waiting, unfortunately, in that situation. Um, but we will continue to open up the months to, um, to the customers to allow them to book um, and to keep working through the numbers. But we have a limit to what we can actually deliver, constrained by the number of people we can actually put through. But we are taking a lot of steps, as you know, <coughs> to actually try and increase that capacity as much as we possibly can. Given this further delay that's happened unexpectedly, um, yeah. how do you assess the number of temp temporary driving instructors that you need? I know, have you considered bringing in uh, experienced uh, driving instructors and quickly putting them through your process so that uh, they can help reduce the backlog? I mean, this question has been raised before. Yeah, uh, I'm asking it again of, because the, the backlog has just got worse and worse and worse. 
and this is impacting on key workers and it's impacting on ordinary people. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the European directive does not allow driving instructors to, to, to deliver driving examination at the same time. Um, there is a, a fairly um, lengthy period for um, driver examiner training, uh, which is why we have taken the route of using the dual role staff that are already trained to deliver driving examinations and augmenting our vehicle testing staff with the temporary workers because we believe that is the quickest way to free up resource to deliver driving tests uh, and makes the most sense because the the, the the training programme for a vehicle examiner is in the region of four weeks uh, where that could be much longer for a driving examiner so we are using that to respond quickly to the demand issues that are out there. Uh, what, what's your model of the backlog? When will it be cleared? Under, under this current model, we we can't answer that today. In that, you know, in terms of the numbers, but we know in normal circumstances, if you could guarantee that everybody who took a theory test um, was then automatically going to take a driving test, but that doesn't that isn't actually the reality of it. It doesn't happen like that. And we also know, and we've discussed this several times with the committee around the pattern of what happened in 2020 will be entirely different to what happened in 2019. Uh, a lot of um, learners will not have been able to have got access to their theory tests. Uh, that was delayed for a time. They won't have been able to access driving <coughs> instructions, so that was delayed for a time. Um, we know it is there and it's growing um, because the number of theory tests are continuing, whereas the driving tests aren't. Um, and all we can do is put in as much capacity as we can, but we are continually constrained by what that looks like. Um, but we are putting in the maximum capacity and we will continue to open slots up as we, as we do. But you cannot compare the numbers from 2019 automatically to 2020. So there's nothing to, there's nothing to base the analysis on, if you like. Can, can you provide us with the numbers of those that you're aware of passed their theory tests and yes, not that passed can't be provided. practical? Don't have it today, so but yes, we do can, have that. Give us those numbers and what your uh, projected capacity assuming everything opens up again will be for each month going forward. I'd like to have some idea of how long these waiting lists will continue because this is inconveniencing, uh, sorry, inconveniencing people and stop people taking up new jobs where they become available. Turning then to MOT centres, um, you've indicated you've reduced the number of people in MOT centres and this has reduced your capacity. Uh, have you furloughed those people? What, what's happened to them? We have all our staff back in our testing centres at the minute. We were we looked at the the furlough model and based on the criteria that was not uh, appropriate um, for to furlough our staff because we were they were resuming work with uh, no intention to make them redundant. So our staff are back in all our test centres, uh, delivering vehicle testing services. Now the so service the itself you've provided us with the, you've you've taken a step to reduce the number of people in MOT centres, which means DVA is operating at a reduced capacity when compared to its normal service delivery model. That's the briefing you gave us? The briefing we gave you in terms of reduce the people is around the customers and not because the that customer wasn't, wasn't clear from that. Um, a customer will go, be involved under normal circumstances in the process, will be in their vehicle throughout until they get the, the stage of the underbody examination of their vehicle, in which case they get out of the vehicle and sit uh, at the side uh, of the test centre. So okay. initially, when we looked at our risk assessment, the customers had to be brought out, and, and that is uh, back to the issue that was raised around shelter okay. earlier on. But while we're operating at a limited testing capacity and the tests take naturally longer because of the COVID restrictions and adaptions that we've put in place, all our vehicle examiners are back working. Okay, I hadn't, hadn't picked up that nuance. Uh, I, I, I understood from that some of your, your examiners may not have been there. Okay, the other issue back to the um, buses, uh, and there is a higher risk uh, to, to, to the public on, on a, a larger vehicle and particularly one that carries passengers, and you're proposing to exempt uh, buses from PSVs for, for a, a further year. Um, how did you come to that determination? Have you not examined any other uh, opportunities to protect the public uh, and ensure uh, safety and good maintenance by, by continuing PSV regime for buses? 
the, the scheme to exempt buses and, and indeed taxis for the requirement for vehicle licence was brought in a to uh, reduce the pressure on our testing capacity. These are licensed operators and uh, are regulated by the, the department, uh, and, and we have access and can access um, through our enforcement bodies uh, maintenance records. I think from the bus perspective, it's important to understand that. Uh, a significant proportion of the bus fleet in Northern Ireland is made up of TransLink and indeed the Education Authority, and they've got very uh, good and robust maintenance regimes in place. Um, but equally, we can spot check stop vehicles at the roadside, and if they are uh, and the conditions that were applied at the time uh, to their their licence extensions made it abundantly clear um, of the requirement to maintain their vehicles in a roadworthiness state, and that they would be subject to other checks at the roadside from enforcement officers, and indeed um, they would run the risk of um, uh, curtailment or suspension or revocation of their licences if their vehicles weren't maintained to an, a satisfactory standard. I, I can understand. Uh, um Translink buses. We've been down through their their uh, workplace where they have brand new uh, hydraulic systems put in for examining under buses and testing them. And it's comparable to, to MOT centres, I would have thought, maybe even of a higher standard. Have you? Uh, uh, so I can understand exempting certain categories where you have high levels of confidence. But you're proposing, at my reading of it, is a blanket uh, exemption. Is that correct? Because I'm, I'm conscious that uh, some school children in the northwest were using buses where it was discovered there was uh, uh, poor levels of maintenance. In fact, many buses had to be taken off the road once they were concentrated on. So I'm concerned if a total exemption is being given uh, without any intelligence or thought. The licences are issued to those vehicles that have been previously tested and issued with a licence uh, and that are currently within the licensing regime. So that is a control and they would have to satisfy uh, certain requirements in terms of, of, of their licence applications at that point in time and indeed have um, the additional controls and conditions that have been applied on that licence. But as I say, um, there is the capacity uh, for enforcement officers and indeed the police to stop and spot check any vehicle on the road for roadworthiness and it really does down, come down to the responsibility of those operators and their transport managers to make sure that they maintain their fleet to a satisfactory standard or they do run the risk then of, of regulatory action being taken against them by the, the licensing authorities. And have you considered emergency legislation to enable uh, PSV to be conducted on um, commercial premises, whether it's TransLink or someone else, so that the uh, inspector can actually go to uh, another garage and do the inspection there? That option has not been considered at this stage. I would certainly ask that to be considered. Okay. Okay, thank you, Mr. Buchanan. Okay, thank you, and I appreciate a lot of points have been covered by uh, Roy there and previous commenters. Uh, my question relates to 30 per cent. Jeremy, did you refer to the, the MOT centres are currently doing 30 per cent? That's the capacity? You reduced by or reduced to? It's approximately 30 per cent of okay. the capacity so, of the vehicles that we can. It takes yeah. approximately 30 minutes to do a vehicle. 30 minutes to do a car. You're doing yeah. rough, roughly, roughly in the past three and an hour and a half, so ultimately you're doing one and an hour and a half. You know, it's a lot, lot, lot slower. I don't know what the actual breakdown is, but I mean, it's a, it's a 30 minute test as opposed to previously, which would have been a 20 minute test per vehicle. So, so what, what, is, what, what restrictions you put in that has reduced that base dramatically so much? I appreciate you have to keep the, the test guys and, and ladies in the centres safe, but what has made that reduction so massive? That's a massive reduction. Well, I think I think um, certainly the the COVID controls uh, around. Um, but what, what are they that has reduced that by seventy percent? About the number of lanes in use and the number and how the staff are operating those lanes. So it's um, you know that because you've got now somebody driving the car rather than the customer driving the car, you're going to end up using staff to do things that previously the customer did. But in, in the so, past, when you driven to the MOT centre, you had the conversation with the instructor. Don't be too sore on that. The jokingly conversation. You jumped out after 30 seconds and the instructor took your car. That has not changed dramatically. So, you know, you had that and that instructor took your car the whole way through the, the system. I can't understand how your capacity is just by 70%. Not all of our lanes are in use uh, in the test centres. That's even more worrying. That's even more worrying. 
but uh, that is part of the health and safety risk assessment that we've done to ensure that there is safety there and protection between the lanes that are operating in test centres. So not all the, the, the light goods lane test centres uh, lanes are operating. Um, and and we're, we've discussed earlier on that we absolutely need to uh, increase our capacity and we've already modelled our demand forecast for January right through to March. Um, uh, and we believe that we will be having to deliver about 50% um, of the vehicle tests from that period forward. But ultimately, uh, Jeremy, you need to increase to get it back up to 100% plus another 50% to, come back on, to catch up. Well, there is no backlog. Well, so, I mean, coming into to March, um, and, and Julie's already highlighted, it's an issue that's going to affect um, uh, a lot of the services across these islands. Um, and, and yes, you're right. We will, you know have to deal with 100% of the vehicles if we are not to find another legislative uh, way to deal with um, exemption certificates. However, um, at this stage, we are looking at sort of the March or through January to March projections to deal with the issues that first arose from the vehicle lifts, uh, and we believe that our capacity for testing vehicles at that stage, and we have modelled that we believe it's possible, is to ramp that up to, to 50%. Okay. Just to prefer that Andre picked up on the point about local garages. I had a local business in Cookstown contacted me and they normally 15 to 16 MOT preparations yeah. per week go down to two. That tells me two things. Either possibly there's other vehicles out there that's not roadworthy. You, know, you, you, can, you can't confirm that. And the capacity has made a massive impact on those businesses. That, that's a problem. And we haven't seen the outworkings of those vehicles that's not roadworthy, which we assume. We only can assume, to be fair. But if, if a, a, a customer goes to the guides, they always go to that same guides generally. So that gentleman's down 13 on average per week cars, those cars are not theoretically roadworthy. And yet the responsibility obviously of the owner Correct. is to keep them roadworthy, which is yeah. why the points were being made. Um, we continue to make those messages and, and, and try and make sure that is out with the public at all times. Um, um, and yet obviously the business is experiencing what, is, what, is, what has happened there. Um, at the moment, obviously, it, because it is completely that owner's responsibility to keep their vehicle safe, um, and that's what we expect them to do. Um, but, um, and, and all we can do is communicate that message. On I an think just and basis. I appreciate I am not carrying out the risk assessment by no means in an MOT centre, but any time I apply the local one in Cookstown, there's always two to three vehicles in every lane queuing. Now there's none. When I go by it four or five times a day, there's never a car queuing. There's an issue there. There's no cars queuing to get into the centre. There has to be a capacity issue or some, but I'll, I'll leave that. And then going on to the, the, the driving uh, tests, I believe there's thousands that have never even got onto the system to book. And you referred, Julie, that this, you, know, you can't go by 2019. Well, go back to 2018. There's still thousands of people going through year on year does the test. They have not even got on the system. And my own daughter is one of them. So they haven't even got on the system to be part of the so-called backlog. How are you going to catch up with it? And I get why I said I, I picked 2019, but it was the same would apply for 2018. We know the circumstances in 2020 are completely different. There is a whole set of learners who would have been out driving and learning in that period, March to June, who, who did not do that and, and weren't able to do it. Equally, the theory tests, you couldn't, you, they only opened from July onwards. Um, and then that, that has obviously then been working through in terms of getting theory test appointments as well. So um, I don't disagree that there are people waiting. Of course there are. We know that. Um, but what you can't do um, is, is automatically assume that the numbers per month in 2020 are the same because learners have not been learning uh, for portions of those months and not learning at the same rate. These last four weeks will have impacted that as well. People who thought they were potentially ready will no longer be ready um, because they've just lost four weeks worth of, of driving instruction unless they're able to get it in some other means through, through their, their household. So predicting what actually the backlog is um, is highly difficult because you've got no historical trend effectively to work from that is accurate. Um, but that, and that's the reality of it. What all we can do is open up the capacity as quickly as we can safely as we can, expand it as much as we can, uh, bring extra people in, which is what they're doing, um, and, and bringing those in at the vehicle examiner side in order to get more capacity quickly into the testing, into the driver yeah, testing well, side. And just, just a final point, the TECs is fine, it's a piece of paper, it says you can legally drive on the road, but you have to maintain your car, fair enough, yeah. and you can continually, if you can, hand out TECs, but you have, you have the risk of unsafe cars driving around the roads, you can't have a TEC to a driver to give a, 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 a test, obviously. 
you can't give them that. But they're there. And if you watch social media, it's thousands of them that are not getting on the system. <clears throat> I asked the question regarding the Sunday night opening. I didn't get an answer because the specific data wasn't there. There's thousands of young people, generally young people, who have not got a test and the problem's coming down the road. You cannot push it back. You have to increase capacity to test. Simple. And we are, as we're saying, but, but, we, but we I, are I have not, increasing. Julie, I have not seen that. And my other colleague, we have not heard that. So we know that, um, and Jeremy's already talked about, we're putting 2,000 extra slots in from November to January. But this is a pandemic. There is a limit to what we can do. Obviously, the last four weeks has not helped. We would have had another four weeks' worth of tests have, would have been done. And we understand the frustration that there is for those young people in particular in and what they would have preferred to happen, and so would we. But at the end of the day, we can only increase the capacity as safely as we possibly can, allow the, 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 the ones who have now been infected, affected twice to be allowed access to the system first, um, and then bring people forward and keep opening up the months as quickly as we can. But there is a backlog across these islands on driving tests, and it is caused by the pandemic. And unfortunately, that is the reality of where we are at. Okay, thank you. Okay, so three more members have indicated, Ms Anderson, Ms Kimmins and Mrs Kelly in that order. Ms Anderson. Uh, thank you. Thank you, um, Julie and, and Germany. And, and obviously, we're very conscious that we're in a, the middle of an awful pandemic. So um, I'm really picking up on your last comments. And I think all of the members are aware of that. Um, but just to explore further around the capacity issue. When did the DVA first start exploring ways to increase testing capacity? So I guess that's been an ongoing process through this. Um, so it go, you go back to things like um, taking back into our usage the three test centres that were used for COVID and bringing that extra capacity in. Um, and that obviously that work has happened and, and all of those three centres are now back in. Um, in terms of them bringing the extra staffing in, that has also been um, worked on um, over, you know, certainly from whenever we knew we could bring driving tests back. That's all been part of the jigsaw puzzle of putting this together. You can't actually put slots in place until you're confident that people will be there to deliver the service. Um, and hence why even though there has been no service for the last few weeks, we have been able to identify another 2,000 slots to go into November, January, and that has been part of the process. So it's been a, it's a, been a work in progress right the way through where people have been trying to push to get more through. As Jeremy also said, we started, we weren't on full shift pattern and MOTs. We've put that up to full shift pattern now. So it's been a massive amount of work within DVA. Um, and I know that there's a huge amount of frustration um, in the public, and we understand that. But there's been a huge amount from Jeremy and his <coughs> team to actually keep everything working and getting as many people access to their services as possible. On the MOT side, that has resulted, as already pointed out, there is no backlog on MOTs. Um, the TECs are taking care of that, and that brings a different issue that has already been pointed out by, by both Keith and Andrew. Um, but and it leaves us then with a driving test backlog, which we are trying then to address. I think, Julie, you need to appreciate that um, all of us are frustrated, obviously yourselves included, um, but there is a perception that it was very late in the day when the increased capacity issue started to be explored. And just picking up on what Keith and others, is saying, others are saying, I think it's something you need to be mindful of, that the evidence of the increased capacity, even though we're living with the restrictions now, but even before then, um, that's not evidence that people are seeing and we are witnessing. So I just leave that with you because we need a demonstration of that. And I don't think that's what we're getting. Regarding the learner drivers, uh, who, whose tests have been recently cancelled. You stated that the DVA contacted customers directly just to advise them that they can reschedule their appointments. Can I ask you, have all of those drivers been successfully contacted? And I say that because I'm sure it's not just ourselves, but there would be other MLEs being contacted 
I drivers asking the questions about when these bookings will be rescheduled. I know you've given us a time frame now, but I am just concerned that perhaps not all of them, or maybe not too many of them, have been contacted. So I think th there's two elements to that. Um, they have yet to be contacted about the 9th of November. We're telling you that. We have to get that message out, and we will do that through the remainder of this, this week uh, so that everybody knows that 9th of November date for, for, only, for only the priority groups, i.e. the key workers and those who had their tests cancelled from March to June. Um, what Jeremy was talking about was, was in the original cancellation and the contacting them about the original cancellation. But you'd be quite right in saying that people are not aware at this point in time and haven't been contacted individually to alert them to the fact they can go into the system from the 9th of November. And that's something we'll be doing over the next couple of days. Yeah, I think we've made um, quite a lot of efforts over this last uh, couple of days in particular to get the uh, key details for them. For some of those uh, folks in that affected group, we have had email addresses and we have had uh, mobile phone numbers, but for some, unfortunately, we've only had postal addresses. So we've written out to them uh, to provide us with uh, email details so that we can contact them quickly. And if anything, that is a lesson you know, in terms of how we can get these messages out uh, to customers as quickly as we can. Uh, we, we have learned from that, and we're hoping to have that information uh, and the email addresses for all those affected customers so we can communicate messages very quickly to them. And as I said, we also use the approved driving instructor network and the council uh, to help get those messages out uh, to their candidates that they have been providing instruction for, which has been a very effective at getting the messages out there. Sorry, Martina, we can't hear you. Okay, no, just uh, turn me off there. Uh, just one last question. Given that you haven't been furnished with that information, then when you state that refunds uh, had been issued as quickly as possible, has this been completed? Because you talked about 1,000 uh, drivers. Have they all been refunded? And how, if you couldn't really contact them to notify them directly around the, um, the rescheduling of the date? So I'm just wondering about the data that you may have available to refund them. When customers book their test, um, the only payment option they had would have been through a credit card or debit card payment. So my understanding is that all those customers have been refunded and their refund has been put back to their card that they provided that they made their initial payment for, in which case we didn't okay. need to they, get their, their, their... They have all been refunded. That is, to the best of my knowledge, they have all been refunded, yes. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you both. Ms. Gimmons. Thanks, Chair, and, and thanks, Julie and Jeremy, uh, for, for the update. Just a couple of things. A lot of the stuff has already been uh, covered. Um, it's In relation to the online booking system, when it reopened on the 5th of October, I know there was a, a bit of an error then. It had reopened early. Did that have a, a big impact then in terms of, like, do we have an idea how many people were able to get booked kind of prior to most people's knowledge that the, the system was even opened? I know that was a big issue that I was getting. The booking um, was intended to open, as you, you rightly say, on the on the fifth of October, and it was advertised as such. Um, our booking provider were doing testing on the system, and uh, they accessed that system. We believe in around eight o'clock that evening to start bookings. We think that there was um, a significant number booked um, before midnight um, on that on that night, uh, but there was still the availability of, of thousands of slots the following day that were booked right out through to January. Uh, and obviously it's something that we're very cognizant of when we reinstate the booking service that that um, anomaly does not uh, happen again. Um, so we'll put in additional controls to ensure that nobody can access the system before um, we advertise it and that everybody has equal opportunity for the slots that are available there. Okay, well, that's fair enough. Um, uh, we talked a lot around uh, dealing with the backlog and, and I know there's um, work on the way to recruit more examiners. Um, in terms of, of that, you know, how do we see that helping with the backlog? Because obviously test centres can still only accommodate so many tests a day. And secondly, in terms of the recruitment, um, is that an internal process or is that are we looking externally as well? It's a bit of a mixture. Um, at the minute, we are looking towards our uh, temporary workers through our own recruitment agency to try and facilitate those um, people and get them in to uh, DBA very, very quickly. Indeed, some of those um, folks that we have recruited have worked with us before, mm -hmm. uh, which helps in terms of the training um, requirements uh, and, and reduces that period of time. We also have uh, a, a recruitment list already for permanent staff. 
with, uh, and we intend to draw 12 people off that. So it's a bit of a mixture of a, a permanent solution and a temporary solution by bringing staff in from, uh, from the recruitment agency. Uh, a lot of them have um, a lot of experience, and that process is, is kicked off um, in terms of five, five staff were trained last week. Uh, and they should be fully up to speed and, and be able to commence testing uh, very soon. Uh, unfortunately, again, another victim of COVID is the amount of staff we can train at any given time. Um, so at the minute, we're training you know, five staff on each batch, and the next five will come in in the next couple of weeks, and we'll continue to do that until we've got the, the complement that we have looked at. Now, at the minute, we've said 27. That may or may not increase, depending on, on how we feel that we're getting through the, the backlog of, of tests. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, just a final point, I suppose, and I had raised it with the Minister before, um, prior to, the, to these, this period of restrictions around examiners. I know um, the Gerard also used it in terms of the MOT centres um, have you know, not been allowed inside. Um, and I know there had been work done to try and address that. And some is at, at this stage now. Is that now complete? Is there, is there facilities indoors for um, sorry, not examiners, driving instructors who are waiting on their their people who's out on a, on a test? We, we have been able to yeah. sort out the driving instructors. Yes. Okay. From September, I think we were able to put in facilities for the driving instructors to use the reception areas in our test centres. Okay. No, that's fair enough. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Kelly. And thank you for the presentation. It's been a difficult year for DVA, given the, the start of the year was with the difficulties with the lift. So um, I acknowledge uh, the work that you and your teams have been doing. But can I ask, um, in terms of HGV tests, particularly for people who work in the sector where they bring lorries in from um, England and then um, resell them here, how does that sit with the tests? And I know that and having spoken to some of the, uh, the people involved in the sector, that there were huge problems trying to get tests booked. Sometimes people have to book for a number of vehicles at the one time, and they had to do a telephone system, uh, which often took a long time to get through to, and then when they got through, maybe weren't with the right department or there, there were difficulties. Uh, can, can I just clarify whether or not that's available as an online service or not? And um, given that we're now into, if you like, the second lockdown as such for the elements of the sector, um, what lessons have been learnt in terms of the response uh, by the department uh, since then and have any of those lessons and recommendations then been implemented? Okay, I mean, I can uh, certainly address the first point in terms of uh, the HGV testing. Initially, the booking service was open and it was through the, the, the call uh, centre booking line only. And there was a lot of demand on that service, as you'd expect, and it caused uh, quite a bit of frustration for, for the HGV and the, the goods vehicle industry in particular, because they uh, would often book multiple vehicles at any given time, and even getting through to that line was causing them a degree of frustration. So we have had a lot of key stakeholder engagement with Logistics UK and the Road Haulage Association, and certainly they expressed in no uncertain terms the frustrations that they were having. Um, however, we reintroduced the booking service uh, for the goods vehicle industry, I think, it was the online booking service on the 1st of October, and since we've been able to do that, it has eased their concerns considerably. Um, a lot of the goods vehicle industry were also used to having standing appointments in some of our test centres so that they could have a bit of flexibility about how they manage their fleet. We have been able to reinstate those as well uh, in our test centre network, so I think that has alleviated a lot of those early uh, concerns and pressures that the industry had in, in early September. Uh, and certainly the feedback has been that the, you know, the service has, has improved considerably, and we are now testing um, goods vehicles across all our 15 test centres, which is another good aspect, because at that stage um, Belfast had not come back online for testing purposes. We only got it back uh, at the, in, in late September. And in terms but of is there, sorry, is there a backlog with that still, or have you, are you catching up well in terms of the, the demand on the service? No, there, there, there's no backlog in terms of, of the, the goods vehicle testing. All the, the, the heavy uh, test centre lanes are, are open, and we've been able to test any vehicle that uh, presents. Um, uh, we're bringing those vehicles forward and have been doing from the 1st of September, so there's, there's no backlog issue with the, the goods vehicle industry. 
Thank you. And I guess just in terms of your question around um, lessons learned, um, you, you're right, there's been a lot of issues that have had to be dealt with over a period of time. And um, So whether it's the learning from risk assessments to do with MOTs, which was then carried into the risk assessments that were done for driving tests, um, the automation processes that were put in place for TECs compared to the early days where that was all done manually. Uh, refunds are now, uh, as Jeremy says, a much more streamlined process compared to, again, a lot of very manual intervention that was done right at the very start. The IT system and the anomalies that um, Ms Gimmons has talked about around um, avoiding problems with that when we reopen again. The fact that we've got the online booking system up and running because the customer service line wasn't able to cope with the demand. Every, you know, there, there is a lot of things that have moved on and changed, um, and we will continue to just capture that learning and keep moving forward as, as we go, um, and make sure that as far as possible we are improving the service and getting as much open as possible. Thank you. Just as a matter of interest, then, in, in terms of any of the changed work practices, will any of them be brought forward as a routine rather than a response? to uh, the COVID pandemic? I think it's unlikely. Um, I think we would want to get back to normal working practices as soon as we can, purely in terms of our capacity and our efficiency and our testing model. It, it, it would make sense as, as soon as we can get back there, the better um, for, for everyone, I think. OK, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, and, and I appreciate you aren't here really to talk about enforcement, but I understand that the good, um, goods vehicle enforcement functions obviously are funded by the levy on HGV and trailer tests. Um, can you maybe provide, maybe if you can't do it today, but even just in writing, just the financial details of how this revenue is ring-fenced and spent specifically on good um, vehicles enforcement? Yeah, I mean, it, it certainly we, we do get a, a proportion of funding. It's a small proportion from, from the levy enforcement. Um, I think it equates to approximately three full-time equivalent staff, um, but it's embedded across all the enforcement officers working in the agency. Uh, enforcement has continued throughout, albeit in a, in, a, in a restricted way, really targeting things like road safety and dangerous and unsafe vehicles. And obviously there's been a lot of work done on the enforcement to make sure that those safe practices can be adhered to. And indeed, they've converted a couple of their enforcement vans to have safe access in dealing with drivers. So there's been a lot of work that has continued from an enforcement perspective throughout the whole COVID pandemic. The impact um, in terms of it. I just need to check, um, obviously, with the restrictions, we are paid as an agent by DFT to deliver the enforcement function around the levy. And with that having stopped, well, we, we, we don't have to do that at this point in time. So um, I can certainly come back to you with more detail on that. Yeah, if you could, if you, if you could provide more detail just in relation to enforcement, I think it would be appreciated. Um, can I um, thank you both for, for your time this morning? Um, no doubt you will be receiving another request, probably in the not too distant future, for to come again to give us a further update, um, uh, and we'll look forward to that. So uh, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. OK, members, we have a, a minute, I think, with, to, to, to wind up here. But um, just in relation to that, um, we're, we're going to be looking at our further programme. Are you content that we look to have a further briefing from DVA before the recess. Yep. If that's, we'll, we'll maybe keep in mind what happens maybe next week with regards to um, restrictions, yep. and if obviously there's no change, if there's no change in that, and um, um, we're getting back to a situation where tests can um, recommence, then it might be appropriate for us to have a, a further briefing in a number of weeks' I think time. Continue to monitor and, and protect yeah. Our, yeah, yeah. We're still blindsided as to the numbers of tests that they're going to be carrying out, so we might just. Well, I think that's right. But if, we, if we're going to give it another sort of five or six weeks, then we have better sense then of what's actually yeah. happening. So if you're content to do that, then we can schedule that. Um, as a follow-up um, from what was said, um, is there anything further you want to go back to the department with, or are you content at this stage? Well, okay. just in relation to you know drivers you know being tested in the future, I don't see what their plan is to catch these young people up generally. I don't see what their plan is. This is just going to roll on and roll on and roll on. They're still there. Okay. Well, if we can, if we can maybe just ask if, for some sort of more thing, more. Um, Chair, we need detail. we need we need exact data on the system. You know what I mean? And when we know the exact data, then we can ask the questions. Because you started to tease out um, in relation to the number of tests they're doing. Do you understand me? 
it's, it's just we definitely need more data, more stats on on both, I think, both I think MOT and, and, and yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 if we can get to some um, more precise information yeah, in relation to the, the numbers uh, rather than through sort of the general numbers that have been um, yep, yep. been articulated, and also the issue and in relation to um, the testing of driving instructors, because that's something which has become um, very obvious that there's a problem there too. So we can do that. Okay, members content. Then moving then to our forward work programme, we do have it just up until the 2nd of December. Um, you'll notice on the 18th of um, November that we're having a briefing with regards to funding for the, um, the taxi and coach operators. Are you content with what we had today, or do you still feel that we need a further briefing on with regard to that? Because that could obviously free up a space. So I'm looking for members' views on that. This is for the 18th of November, yes. Yeah. Can I ask, I mean, where is there a further fund to draw down on? Because, um, you know, it's, yes, we don't like that, you know, double the money, but is there a fund to draw down on? Well, maybe, uh, the executive. maybe if you're content, we'll, we'll, maybe we'll, um, um, staff will maybe have a conversation yeah. with um, the department to see who's coming up to do that briefing, whether there's going to be anything additional added to, uh, yes. because we did have a much longer session this morning yes. than we anticipated, because it was really particularly in relation to um, SL1s. And, yeah. um, so we'll maybe have that conversation and then come back. Lovely. Okay, if you're content with that, we'll, we'll leave that sort of flexible. Okay. Good idea. Okay, thank you. Um, any other business? Yes, there are just two things because I was trying to find the page earlier on. Uh, we have two briefing papers from the uh, two research papers, one in terms of the electric vehicles and also one in terms of sewage and water. Can we put that on our forward work programme? And also mm -hmm. uh, the other issue I meant to mention, because it was at page 26, was a different uh, minute actually. Same in relation to the procurement for gritting vehicles. Mm -hmm. Can you get a wee update on where that's at, please? Because okay. it, was, it was in a different set of minutes, I just couldn't find the page. So. But it's related oh. to the procurement for procurement the Gretton thing. The vehicles. Remember, we were out. Uh, okay, so if Chair, you Chair, just one other point, sorry. Just, just to be clear, this Translake, I assume, is getting no financial support from this package? You know, for Not the as coach operators, no. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it, was sure. it was said but it was for private. It's private operators. We, we don't private want to get this. It's private operators. It no, it's, a, it's, very it's, a, it's a very distinct. Okay. Um, Stink pack. Fair enough. Okay. <laughs> so, um, obviously, just as you're leaving, obviously be careful with regards to social distancing and so on. Our next meeting um, will take place next um, Wednesday, the 11th of November, um, in room 29. We will be starting at 9.30, and the meeting will, will finish at 12. There will be um, a break from... Um, 10.50 to 11.20 um, with regards to um, Armistice Day, so just be mindful of that um, next um, Wednesday. So um, if you're all content, the meeting will adjourn. Thank you. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program.